really, even after all that. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together. The, um, good afternoon. I'm Larry Ponoroff, and it's um, my pleasure to welcome you to the 12th annual commemoration of Constitution Day at Arizona Law. I, uh, I know there's a right of free assembly somewhere in the Constitution, and we want to thank you all, so many of you, for assembling here uh, right freely. Well, some of the students, actually, but that's a different story. Um, and I want to thank our distinguished panel. Uh, I know they all worked uh, very hard um, preparing for the presentations today, and I really think you're going to find it an interesting and um, stimulating uh, presentation and discussion. Um, once again this year, Constitution Day at Arizona Law was sponsored and organized through our Rehnquist Center, which of course was established several years ago to honor the legacy of the former Chief Justice by providing public understanding and education with respect to key critical themes of the constitutional structure of our government. Issues like separation of power and federalism and judicial independence. Um, over the years, like this program, the Rehnquist Center has done some extraordinary programming, which has frankly brought great prestige to the College of Law and the university, and almost of equal importance, has served um, an incredible public service, both in our community and across the nation. Now, in a moment, um, I'm going to turn things over to Sally Ryder, who, in addition to being an alumna of this institution, is the director of um, the Rehnquist Center, and she's going to introduce um, our panel. Um, before I do, however, um, I did want to, um, one, apologize to all of you and to the panel, not just for having my back to them the entire time, but to all of you for the fact that as soon as I turn it over to Sally, um, I will be leaving. And I wanted you um, to know um, the, the reason why, so you didn't misunderstand the gesture. Now, one possible reason, of course, is that deans are essentially ornaments, and once it gets down to substance, I'm largely superfluous. Um, but today I have a better reason, and that is I am actually in the middle, I'm taking a break, of a conference call of a subcommittee of the Advisory Committee on Bankruptcy Rules on which I serve. And in view of the fact that Congress's power to promulgate uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcy derives directly from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 of the United States Constitution, I cannot imagine a better way for me to be spending Constitution Day. So, once again, thank you all um, for joining us. I think you're in for a treat. And now, here's Sally. Thank you, Larry. I also want to thank uh, the Marshall Foundation and the Wings Like Eagle Foundation, whose generosity helps support public programs like this. And uh, now I'm going to introduce the panelists. On my far right is Judge Neil Wake, who sits on the District Court for the District of Arizona in Phoenix. Before taking his seat on the bench in 2004, he was in private practice in Arizona and was both an election law and an appellate litigation specialist. Judge Wake has been a frequent contributor to our programs, and I want to thank him for his support of the center and for being here today. Next to Judge Wake is Tony Massaro, who is Regents Professor, Milton O. Reapy Chair in Constitutional Law, and the Dean Emerita of the James E. Rogers College of Law. 
She was the driving force behind the creation of the Rehnquist Center and sits on the advisory board. Thank you very much, Tony. Next to uh, Dean Massaro is Maureen Mahoney, who's a member of the appellate practice in Latham and Watkins, Washington, D.C. office and former United States Deputy Solicitor General. She's handled a broad range of constitutional appellate litigation in the Supreme Court and other courts throughout the country, including, I think, 21 arguments before the Supreme Court. Um, before I ever saw Ms. Mahoney argue before the Supreme Court, I heard this story that I thought was an apocryphal story, and it was that during her very first argument before the court, she was so incredibly good that the justices during the argument were passing notes back and forth, commenting on what a brilliant job she was doing. And then I saw Maureen argue for the first time, and I realized it had to be true because she's that good. Um, Maureen is also a member of the Rehnquist Center Board, and she traveled from Nantucket to get here, which was uh, a long way for her to come. I appreciate the, your support of the center and being here today. Thank you. Just wanted some more. <laughs> And last but not least, David Marcus uh, is an associate professor of law here at the College of Law. He graduated from Yale Law School, clerked for Judge Willie Fletcher on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. He is also a frequent presenter at our Constitution Day program, and I appreciate especially his willingness to summarize the cases each year. And that's especially true today. I want to thank Professor Marcus and all of the panelists because the opinions today run over 500 pages. And um, they're dense. It's not light reading. So um, thank you all. Uh, Professor Marcus is going to start us off, as he usually does, with a what I anticipate is going to be a brilliant, funny, and left-leaning description to set the stage <laughs> for the panel's discussion. And then he will uh, summarize each case. And after each time he summarizes a case, the panel will discuss the case. And if we have time, we'll take questions from the audience. Professor Marcus. You'll note that the qualifications of the panelists uh, dramatically fell off when we got to the end. Um, thank you very much to Sally Ryder for organizing today's exercises, and, and thank you very much uh, to the members of the panel, particularly to Ms. Mahoney and to Judge Wake, our uh, outside visitors who are great friends of the school. It's really an honor to have them here with us today. I want to start with three disclaimers. First, I'm not a constitutional law uh, scholar. I'm a proceduralist, and only two types of people are willing to spend their lives researching civil procedure, either overworked deans or uh, uh, simple-minded mouth breathers. I'm not an overworked dean, so you can uh, draw your own conclusion. I'll do my best to give a summary, uh, to summarize these opinions as accurately as I can, but I, am assume, I will anticipate that our panelists will have to clean up the mess that I make. Second, I know that some of you think about law professors the way uh, that Woody Allen described New Yorkers in his great movie Annie Hall, that we're all left-wing communist Jewish homosexual pornographers. Um, I think of that, us that way, and I'm a, I am a law professor. So I'll say at the outset that I don't have any pretenses towards objectivity. And then third, I talk quickly. So uh, I'll take a few minutes to give an introduction to the term before we get to the cases. As in years past, I'll use this time to indulge one of my obsessions. To introduce a Supreme Court term with some claim about an underlying theme or overarching message is a difficult task. The court does not begin each term uh, with some goal of writing a novel or a jurisprudential treatise that has some underlying consistency to it. Rarely do the court's decisions follow some sim simplistic pattern that lends itself to facile characterization. The supposedly pro-corporate arch-conservative Roberts Court ended the term with six straight consecutive pro-plaintiff decisions in civil cases. Rather than try to articulate some theme for this past turn, I'd like to reflect a little bit about our current uh, constitutional moment. I cannot recall a time when the Constitution seemed as ever-present in our political discourse as, is, as it is today. Last summer, in the heated debates over President Obama's health care plan, uh, opponents were fond of invoking the Tenth Amendment uh, as a purported bulwark against uh, what they saw to be an overreaching, uh, over, uh, a power grab by the uh, federal government. On the other side of the political spectrum, Many liberals a few years ago expressed a lot of interest in Article I, Section 8, which uh, gave Congress the power to declare war, and used this Article I, Section 8 as an argument that the Bush administration's prosecution of hostilities in Iraq and Afghanistan was illegitimate. I could easily multiply these examples. It's tempting to wield these constitutional arguments in political debate because they are trumps. If I disagree with you as a political matter, 
I may find your position abhorrent and disgusting, but it's not unlawful, it's not out of bounds. But when I say that your political opinion is unconstitutional, I am saying it is indeed out of bounds and is legally unacceptable. Law is something apart from and superior to politics, or so the understanding goes, and it should beat it every time. There's a deep irony in this use of law as a trump in political debate. Once I say that your political opinion is unconstitutional and therefore out of bounds, I make our political differences irreconcilable. When we disagree simply as a political matter, there's always the possibility that you might convince me. But once I say that your opinion is unconstitutional, I cannot admit that I would ever buy into it unless I were to accept a lawless society. Our politics become more polarized, not less, as we introduce law into the debate, or at least a conception of law, uh, a law as apart from and superior to politics. I think extreme polarization pretty well describes our, politi our current political atmosphere. And I think that mindless descriptions of law and the role of the judge by people who know better should be shoulder some blame for how this misuse of constitutional text has further entrenched our political divisions. The insipid analogy Chief Justice Roberts drew between a judge and an umpire and the, uh, an analogy that sub the subsequent three Supreme Court nominees parroted at their confirmation hearings and an analogy crucial to the maintenance of the law politics divide has in particular proven destructive. But the, isn't, the alternate to a rigid law, isn't the alternative to a rigid law politics divide cynicism? The opposite is true, I think. When you accept that there are no legal certainties and that texts take on new meaning depending on changing political, social, and economic climates, then you understand, to quote Justice Holmes, that certainty is generally an illusion and repose is not the destiny of man. If you don't treat the Constitution as uh, apart from the living political moment, if you aren't willing to accept that the way we should resolve disputes is by violence, then you have to put faith in the process of dispute resolution we've given to us and the people to whom we entrust that process, chiefly judges, that they will work together in good faith, often disagreeing, but always accepting legitimate disagreement as acceptable toward a better constitutional future. As David Souter recently said in a speech that I urge you all to read and study carefully, a speech he gave last May at the Harvard commencement, as he said in a speech that is an eloquent antidote to the uh, ball and strikes absurdity of several years ago, in an indeterminate world I cannot control, it is still possible to live fully in the trust that a way will be found leading through an uncertain future. If we understood that there is no impermeable boundary between law and politics, and that constitutional law is in many important respects nothing more than politics, we could have our debates over the burning issues of the day, even argue over our side's constitutionality, without the Constitution becoming a wedge that drives us further apart. Each of the four cases we'll discuss today illustrates in a different way how law is indeed inseparable from politics. There are sort of surface level ways to make this point. One is that each decision is a 5-4 uh, decision uh, with the split along ideological lines. One of the decisions, Citizen United, is indeed a spur to cynicism because I cannot imagine a more brazenly political decision. But another, uh, I, couldn't also, I also couldn't imagine a more thoughtful, inspired set of opinions than what the court produced in the McDonald versus Chicago case. Decisions that, although they reflect the justices' ideological divisions, are also so richly and intelligently argued that they make me confident that reasoned elaboration and respect for disagreement are indeed possible despite our overheated political climate. I'd happily prefer an understanding of law as on a continuum with politics if it commits us to the kind of reasoned elaboration that's evidenced in McDonald over the smug certainty of law as autonomous from politics if it means irre irreducible divisions. With that moralizing and preaching over, I'll turn to the uh, Christian, legal, Christian Legal Society case. Boy, I forget the name of the case uh, right now. That's, we're in, in big trouble. Christian Legal Society versus Martinez is the paradigm of what I would call a hard case. A group of students at the Hastings College of Law, which as you probably know is part of the University of California system, asked the college to recognize the chapter their chapter of the Christian Legal Society as an officially registered student organization. Citing its non-discrimination policy, Hastings refused on grounds that the CLS required its members and officers to sign a statement of faith that disavowed homosexual conduct. CLS challenged this refusal on First Amendment grounds. Given how hard this case is, it's ridiculous that I, that I someone who can barely spell the First Amendment, should introduce it when we have our, on our panel one of the lawyers who represented Hastings before the Supreme Court. My august colleague, Dean Massaro, has come up with six frames which I, I think we can use to understand the case. I'll let her elaborate on these, but let me suggest one which I'm sure is overly simplified but might be of use. On one hand, I, I think of this case as a clash of rights. On one hand, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered students would argue that they have a right to attend a public institution of higher education that does not sanction discrimination based on sexual orientation. 
On the other, members of a faith-based organization whose religious tenets frown on homosexual conduct would argue that they have a right to associate only with those who share their beliefs and that the institution cannot deny them this right. How do we navigate between this constitutional scylla and charybdis and get the answer right? Having to deal with these sorts of issues is a reason why I believe that the willingness to serve as dean of a law school is rebuttable evidence that someone is uh, suffering from incipient mental insanity. Here are the facts. You got better. I'm recovered. Re I stress rebuttable presumption, a rebuttable presumption. That's not to say that there other, aren't other pieces of evidence that strengthen the presumption in this instance. Here are the facts. To quote from its mission statement, the Christian Legal Society is a nationwide organization that seeks to proclaim love and serve Jesus Christ through the study and practice of law. CLS has chapters across the country, including one here in Tucson for practicing lawyers and a chapter at the University of Arizona Law School for students. Student CLS chapters permit anyone at all to come to meetings, but to be a, uh, a, 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 an officer or voting member, according to its bylaws, someone must conduct their, their life according to established tenets. These include the principle that there shall be no sexual conduct outside of marriage, with marriage defined as that between a man and a woman, a principle that necessarily excludes LGBT uh, members and officers. In 2004, a group of students at Hastings applied to their college to have their chapter, the CLS, recognized as a registered student organization, or an RSO. RSOs at Hastings get some modest benefits. They can use official law school channels to communicate with students, such as uh, 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 listservs and the like. They can publicize events in law school newsletters. They can use Hastings organization email addresses. They get some modest funding. But most importantly, I think, they get the Hastings imprimatur on their official doings. Now, the problem is that Hastings requires all RSOs to abide by a non-discrimination policy, which provides that organizations may not discriminate unlawfully on the basis of a number of enumerated categories, including sexual orientation. As Hastings insisted during litigation, this is an all-comers policy, a policy that requires student organizations to allow any student to participate fully and assume leadership positions regardless of her uh, conduct or beliefs. The administration refused to recognize the CLS as an RSO, I'm starting to sound like my brother-in-law, the colonel in the U.S. Air Force, um, who re refers to my sister-in-law as, um, uh, as W-A-M-O-M-C, wife and mother of my children. <laughs> um, CLS could meet in law school rooms, but Hastings would do nothing to support the organization and, deny, and, and thus denied it its imprimatur. In response, CLS uh, sued, alleging uh, that uh, the refusal to recognize a group as an RSO violated its First Amendment rights. The District Court of the Ninth Circuit agreed with Hastings, uh, and the Supreme Court granted cert. I should say that this issue has come up at other schools. CLS has sued the Arizona State, Ohio State, and the Southern Illinois University Law Schools over similar refusals. It just so happens that the Hastings case went to the Supreme Court. I'm not really, really sure why. It might have something to do with the fact that the Ninth Circuit is an irresistible target for the justices, uh, a, 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 a target that, that has given it the moniker, in words of one of my former bosses, is the Ninth Circuit reverse-o-matic. As I see it, there are two key issues in this case, one factual issue and one legal. The factual issue is the following. Was Hastings policy an all-comers policy or a non-discrimination policy? An all-comers policy would require student organizations to accept anyone regardless of a person's belief. So the Hastings Democratic Law Student Society, for example, would have to permit Republican students to join and actually become officers and perhaps even the president. A non-discrimination policy would prohibit student organizations from discriminating against individuals on certain enumerated grounds having to do with race, religion, and sexual orientation, but otherwise permit groups to discriminate based on beliefs. So the Hastings Democratic Law Students Society, for example, could, uh, could uh, uh, refuse to permit a Republican student to become a, a member or an officer. This is an important question because it goes as a fact factual question because it arguably goes to the issue of, of viewpoint neutrality. The legal question is, was Hastings' policy reasonable and viewpoint neutral? Was, whether the policy was an all-comers or non-discrimination policy, the factual question is important to resolving this legal one. Justice Ginsburg wrote the majority opinion on behalf of herself and the four other godless communists, Stevens, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kennedy. And Justice Alito wrote the dissent for himself and the three other religious fanatics, Justices <laughs> Roberts, Scalia, and Thomas. As to the first question, the factual question of what type of policy Hastings applied, Ginsburg found this to be an easy case. As written, the policy at issue was a non-discrimination policy, but as applied, she said, it was an all-comers policy. And she stressed that Hastings had always applied as an all-comers policy, something that the parties stipulated to at the summary judgment stage, that they stipulated that it was an all-comers policy. Now, Justice Alito strenuously disagreed with this characterization, 
He said, well, yes, it's true that by 2005, Hastings, as, a, as for its litigation position, was describing its policy as an all-comers policy, that before then it had been administered as a non-discrimination policy that selected out religious organizations but did not require other uh, organizations that, uh, that formed around certain beliefs to, uh, permit, to, to allow everybody to participate. Now, uh, Justice Alito's argument on this front angered Justice Ginsburg a great deal, essentially mostly because Justice Alito seemed to insult the, uh, the uh, veracity of a distinguished civil procedure professor. And there's one thing that we all know, and that is civil procedure professors do not lie. They are the, uh, the, the, the core of our moral center in, in this otherwise uh, a, a torn country. Because of this, Ginsburg claims Alito engages in make-believe, describes his argument as desperate and warped analysis, and criticizes him for impugning the veracity of a distinguished legal scholar and well-respected school administrator. Harsh words from Justice Ginsburg. Okay, assuming that it was indeed an all-comers policy, did it violate the CLS's First Amendment rights? Hastings' RSO system is what we call a limited public forum. Hastings is a public law school. But the use of its public spaces are rather the channels it provides for communication. Uh, like those that the RSOs can exploit, can be limited. The fact that Hastings is public doesn't mean, for example, that the San Francisco chapter of Jews for Jesus can demand to use its classrooms. More to the point, the fact that Hastings is public doesn't mean that Jews for Jesus can insist that they should be able to table at student orientation events and the like. Hastings can restrict access to its limited public fora if the restriction is reasonable and viewpoint neutral. To an extent, a limited public fora is a benefit or subsidy that Hastings provides, and it can condition access to the subsidy on certain, uh, for, with certain restrictions. The standard for re reviewing a policy that restricts access to a limited public forum is, is the policy reasonable and is the uh, restriction viewpoint neutral? Justice Ginsburg has little difficulty determining that the policy is reasonable. Law schools should have some flexibility in determining the best educational environments for its students, Law schools can take steps to ensure that they won't subsidize, public law schools, they won't subsidize conduct such as, such as discrimination against uh, people based on sexual orientation that law schools don't uh, want to uh, sanction. Justice Ginsburg also has little difficulty finding that the all comers policy is viewpoint neutral. It draws no distinction between groups based on message or perspective to the extent that it requires CLS members to associate with those whom they find morally abhorrent this is just an incidental effect of an otherwise neutral policy. You have to take everybody in your organization. From the perspective of someone such as I, who knows about as much about the First Amendment as Sarah Palin, uh, there's the homosexual Jewish law professor pornographer uh, coming in, not necessarily in that order. <laughs> um, this is where the opinion starts to smack of some legal hocus pocus, at least to me. Justice Ginsburg insists that Hastings' policy permits the CLS to broadcast any anti-gay message it wants. Hastings could not have a, have a policy that prohibited uh, uh, that restricted groups' beliefs. This would be an impermissible restriction on speech. But Hastings can require the CLS to admit as members any gay student who wants to join. CLS, I would imagine, argue that conduct is a form of expressing beliefs and that the act of association is itself, itself the expression of a belief. Justice Ginsburg, it seems to me, denies the idea that we broadcast our beliefs through our associations, something I have a hard time agreeing with. I think the decision was correctly decided, but if I were writing from scratch without all the First Amendment uh, uh, hand-me-downs the court has to deal with, I'd probably more frankly acknowledge the clash of rights in this case and try to explain as a pragmatic matter why the balance favors Hastings. I think there's something a little bit formalistic in Judge Justice Ginsburg's distinction between uh, uh, belief and conduct. But now it's time to let my co-panelists uh, set the record straight and explain why I'm wrong. Thank you, Professor Marcus. Um, Ms. Mahoney, as having represented Hastings uh, in the Supreme Court, um, as Professor Marcus pointed out, there was quite a difference in interpreting the record between the majority and the dissenting opinions. And the Ninth Circuit opinion, which was the opinion that went to the Supreme Court, was only about two sentences long. Did, did that make it more or less difficult to defend the Ninth Circuit's judgment? Sally, it wasn't just about two sentences long. It was two sentences long. <laughs> um, did it make it more or less difficult? I, I think that it probably made it um, a bit more difficult because it, I think it, it really fueled the dissent's um, in uh, sense that they needed to have a full record on this very difficult issue. Because the Ninth Circuit had treated the issue summarily, I think that really caused the dissenters to feel that there had to be a full airing of what they viewed to be the, the salient uh, history here. And I, I'm not sure that they would have done that if there had been a complete opinion uh, from, from the Ninth Circuit. On the other hand, 
the Ninth Circuit's two sentences got it exactly right. What they said is there is a stipulation here that this is an all-comers policy, and that means it's viewpoint neutral and, and it's reasonable, and therefore it's constitutional. And so uh, from that perspective, you know, that makes it easier to defend because they, they, you weren't having to run from the rationale. Uh, on the issue of, you know, this debate uh, between the majority and, and the dissent about what the record really was, I would just like to read the stipulation quickly because I, I can't help it, uh, but I'm an advocate. Um, you know, this idea that Hastings' policy wasn't really that uh, the Democratic caucus um, would be required to admit you know, those who um, have Republican beliefs. The CLS actually stipulated to the following, Hastings requires that RSOs allow any student to join uh, regardless of status or beliefs. Thus, for example, the Hastings Democratic caucus cannot bar students holding Republican political beliefs from becoming members or seeking leadership positions. That's in the stipulation. So I think it was quite fair for the majority to say, this is how the case comes to us. It, uh, what CLS is asking for is prospective relief and injunction against enforcing a policy that they have stipulated uh, would require a Republican organization to accept Democrats and vice versa. And so um, we find on the basis of that record that this is a viewpoint neutral policy. So I, I think you know, the majority definitely had the, the right view of what the factual background was. What, what's the significance of the case, do you think? Uh, well, I think, I think it's significant, certainly, uh, from Hastings' perspective. This is their policy, and it means that uh, their policy can be enforced going forward, uh, that uh, they, they do not have to recognize a student group that uh, wants to exclude others on, any, uh, on the basis of any status or belief, whether that's uh, because the students are gay or whatever else it might be, uh, their political beliefs or whether they uh, you know, are, are Nazi supremacists or you know, whatever it might be. They don't want to have to draw those lines and, uh, and so they want to have an all-comers policy. That means for other uh, law schools and colleges around the country, they now I think have a green light to use a similar policy if that furthers their own interests. They don't need to, but they can. Uh, I think that the, it's clear though that, the, that one of the issues that's left open is that for those schools who want to have a different policy, a policy that says, well, we would like for some groups to be able to exclude on the basis of um, their political beliefs, but we don't want to allow exclusion based upon, uh, let's say, whether a student is gay, a, a more classic you know, anti-discrimination policy um, protecting certain groups and certain status. That question has been left open, and so we'll, we'll have to see what happens, uh, you know, in in future litigation if schools decide to that that's the policy they want. Fair amount of um, deference to legislator, I mean, deference to educators in this in this setting, though, uh, and so I think there's a lot of good things for schools uh, to hang their hat on in the in the uh, in the opinion, but it's certainly an open question. Mm -hmm. Dima Um the only thing I'm worried about, it's, it's not inconsistent at all with what Maureen has said, but I think what we need to look to the possibility of is a state level trumping move, that the state could, in the wake of this, if someone lobbies them, say, because Ginsburg was careful to say that the policy was permissible but not constitutionally required. And so it is conceivable that a state legislature would pass legislation prohibiting public institutions within its jurisdiction from adopting rules like this. Um, in other words, uh, prohibiting um, student organizations or schools from demanding that student organizations um, have such a non-discrimination policy. And we're seeing a lot of this. Um, I see a number of members of the Office of General Counsel here, and I think they're well familiar with that dialogue that goes on between the legislature, lobbyists, and outcomes of specific Supreme Court cases. So I think that's something <clears throat> to watch. Um, and I don't think um, that it's possible uh, to figure out what the policy has written, what the court would have done with it. Um, it Ginsburg really doesn't address it. And, um, and so those of you who have policies, and ours is somewhat like that, um, that does distinguish on the basis of uh, characteristics rather than an all-comers policy. I don't think it's out of the realm of reason that it could prevail on a constitutional challenge, but it, I think it's more vulnerable after this case. 
I also agree with Maureen why it's a tough case. I mean, this case is a con law teacher's dream. I, am, I have put it on the exam for 10 years. I'll put it on this year. It doesn't matter um, how many times I tell them it's going to be on the exam because there are so many vectors that come into it. On the one hand, you look at it as a funding case. And if it's a funding case, most of the case law suggests, and it would be rather nutty uh, for government not to have substantial discretion, not uh, uh, equal, not um, neutral, uh, but specific ends it wants to advance through its funds, it's allowed to put those conditions on its money. So uh, they did a great job of characterizing the case, putting it in the frame of a funding case, and then it should be all done but the shouting. I mean, I think that the overwhelming um, evidence points in the direction of Hastings having that sort of discretion. When you add a forum feature to it, though, uh, the public forum, limited forum, non-public forum, not a forum at all, I won't uh, bore you with the details or try to trouble the limited intelligence of Dave with those kinds of <laughs> distinctions. <laughs> but it's a tough and mostly, I think, ultimately illusory distinction among those categories. I think that um, Thurgood Marshall was right, that it ought to be broken down into a more of a factored analysis of does the, is the speech compatible um, with what government is trying to do in the setting that is more bounded than the street corner. Um, and, um, and so those were the big framing moments that controlled the lawyers as well they should. Last thing I'll say is I actually think there's a subterranean aspect to this and that's what the paper I've done is about. I think that um, at, Maureen hinted at this at the end too in saying it's substantially deferential to um, the officials on the ground. And I think rightly so. Officials on the ground know that even if a student organization engages in speech under the umbrella of the school, that the state action doctrine might not attribute their speech to the school as a legal matter because the state action doctrine has shrunk so since the 70s. The school knows that they are held to a standard that is conflicting in and of itself um, and that people will assume that the imprimatur of the school is relevant. You know, the school flag, flag flaps over it just like it, uh, the, the state flag and, and U.S. flag flapped over the building that housed the coffee shop that uh, discriminated on the basis of race. These students wanted access to the official imprimatur. They had access in other ways, um, but they wanted to belong. And the, the request for belonging makes the case hard. It, gets, it becomes hard to deny full belonging. But the request for belonging is to something that itself needs to stand for something else. And it is, I think, just a repetition of the balance between standing for equality and standing for full First Amendment uh, neutrality and marketplace of ideas. And we'll never completely um, be satisfied we've gotten that balance right. And I think they understood that Hastings Law School had a real dilemma on its, on its hands once, not the students, but once the national organization arrived. And that's another, I think, hidden part of this is that in a lot of cases it was not the student chapters that um, um, brought this thing um, up. It was a more, and a, Maureen may know more about it than I. Uh, I would just say that in the, in the record itself, it shows that um, before the litigation was brought, CLS had, uh, a, had a gay member of the organization. And when asked um, in deposition about how that worked, uh, the representative said she, it was a joy to have her as a member of our organization. So it, it leaves you wondering, you know, what is fueling this litigation? It's, it's, it's not unlike, and it, this doesn't come in right, left, center, stripe, um, but national attempts to, the Connerly Amendment um, is a nationally orchestrated attempt to change the law state by state. And CLS, I think, wants its brand, its imprimatur, to imply certain things, and they say these are our rules, and, and one should obey our rules. Um, but the students themselves, it wasn't, I think, sufficiently organic that, uh, that the students' um, deviation from some of those rules, I think it may have been a bad move on the part of CLS, um, with all due respect, um, to say that to their students. But at least um, they've said it very clearly now, and um, the students will decide for themselves what they think that does or doesn't mean. Thank you. Judge Wee? Well, I have some comments that uh, perhaps touch more on the lawyering aspects of this case, which leap out of this to me. 
Uh, first is the, um, the stipulation of facts that the dissent simply attempted to disregard. And uh, as a lawyer and as a trial judge, this is dazzling. Um, now, perhaps they were let into it because the law school had uh, diverse defenses of its, of its policy. But there it was, a stipulation of facts as clear as day. Um, the, uh, and by the way, the second thing is the Ninth Circuit's two-sentence affirmance. Now, uh, let me tell you, they were not picking on CLS because the Ninth Circuit routinely has memorandum decisions of that brevity or not much longer because they have, they dispose of six or 7,000 cases a year. And if there is what appears to be uh, a sword to cut the Gordian knot, they're not going to unravel the Gordian knot. So. That's what they saw here, and um, I know they've done it to me. I, I'm happy to be affirmed on a one-paragraph decision. And, and uh, one time they reversed a 35-page opinion I wrote, uh, just citing a decision that no one had cited to me, and they were right. So that was the end of my decision. But So they weren't picking on CLS when they thought there was a clear dispositive a basis to decide the case. Um, this is an interesting case because of the tone of both the majority and the dissenting opinion. The, the majority opinion has a, uh, perhaps a clinical disdain for the dissent, and the dissent has an unclinical disdain for the majority. <laughs> um, and um, I'm going to offer a little bit of, um, of an eye, a thought as to what may be going on here. Um, the Christian Legal Society brought a number of these cases around the country, and they brought one against the Arizona State University. I was the assigned judge in that case. And uh, fortunately for me, the case settled a couple days before trial, so I didn't have to decide the case, uh, although it did rear its head later on a motion for award of attorney's fees claiming that the settlement was really a victory for, for CLS. Um, and. Um, I'm, I'm going to offer an analysis that was presented in that case. What, what, what the university did, and I haven't checked this, but I assume that since this was the Board of Regents, this is probably the policy at this university and Northern Arizona University as well, not just Arizona State. But in any event, uh, in, in that case, the, the, the university had a, a non-discrimination policy virtually identical to the Hastings. It had never been a source of any conflict or decision from anyone. The national CLS approached the Arizona State chapter and asked them to get involved in litigation. And so the way they did that was, and they voted to, to do that, they wrote a letter to the administration declining to apply for certification as a student organization because they couldn't sign off on the non-discrimination policy. The university then rescinded the non-discrimination policy. Um, the lawyers for CLS then wrote another letter saying we're still not going to apply because um, we have to abide by the student code of conduct, and they thought this was implicit in the student code of conduct. Um, they were clearly attempting to set up litigation, so they finally um, filed a lawsuit, not having applied for membership uh, after having written letters saying, we're not applying because you're discriminating against us for these reasons. That's how it came to me. The case was settled um, with the university making some changes, first of all, they agreed that religion, religiously based student organizations could uh, exclude members for non-adherence non to the religion which is, was the source of the common interest, uh, provided that they did not violate other non-discrimination policies, including discrimination against uh, homosexuals. Um, but they agreed that uh, CLS's general criterion of membership that one uh, disapprove of sexual conduct outside of traditional marriage would not be a violation of that anti-discrimination policy. So that's how the case held up. And I believe that's probably still the policy in all of our state universities. Um, the, um, the argument for that policy was that with respect to the exclusivity of uh, the exclusion of on the basis of religion, that where the common interest of the organization is is a religion, that non-adherence to that religion is not in any way invidious to the person who's excluded. It's not a mark of a program. It's just a lack of interest. 
This, of course, it can be viewed as a matter of degree, but as a matter of degree, there's, I think, some substance to that. And uh, with respect to the now approved policy of requiring adherence uh, to the disapprobation of sexual conduct outside of traditional marriage, although this plainly has a disparate impact on homosexuals, uh, the argument is that that disparate impact, uh, disparate impact is a result of all kinds of classifications and it lacks the particular sting of a focused exclusion. Uh, th that was the, the analysis and that is pretty much the way it works in our universities now. Um, as to the significance of this case, um, I, other than uh, legislatures or other bodies changing the actions of universities, I'm wondering whether there's going to be f much for the litigation because at least for now the Supreme Court has given a safe harbor for universities to do the um, all comers policy and our universities are even <coughs> more generous to the exclusionary policies of student organizations. Uh, and the reality, and, and Justice uh, Ginsburg discusses this in her opinion, is that um, student self-selection of interest is likely uh, w to trump uh, neutrality requirements, that, that students will participate in the things that they're interested in. It's not very likely that there will be obstructionist participation in, in other uh, groups. But the last thought I want to offer is it, it's great talking here with there are a lot of lawyers and, and judges here, but it's especially great to be talking to all of the students here. And I want to offer some comments about just pure lawyering. Um, the first is the point I made about the stipulation of facts. Uh, and the moral of that story is you need to have your case figured out. You can't, you can't just evolve in an ad hoc way in response to things. You have to have a, a grand theory and, and you have to understand your weaknesses. You have to understand what you can give up, what your objectives are. And it looks like they didn't do that in this case. Now it did, and it reached up to bite them when they got to the Supreme Court, that is, reached up to bite CLS. Um, the other thing that leaps out of this, both partly from the Hastings case and, and other cases that I, I was watching the Hastings case as I was presiding over mine, and I read Judge White's decision when it came down and Judge Kaczynski's affirmance. But one has to ask a question of, um, what were the roles of the lawyers and what were the roles of the clients in this litigation? Um, because um, there had been no problem at Arizona State University with their CLS group. Um, and they, they were approached by uh, lawyers, I have what they call the out-of-town lawyers, I guess. Um, and they agreed to participate in this. And the, uh, there are consequences which appeared in the record that I had to uh, examine later of a great conflict and difficulty in the ASU organization. Students left, uh, not so much out of anger as hurt, and or maybe out of anger. Uh, the other other students left and formed other organizations. And one has to wonder if you're a lawyer asking people to undertake litigation, uh, what what you tell them, and and whether they advise them of the consequences of different courses of action. Um, and um, so when you all get out there, I trust that you will all remember that you, everything you do is within the bounds of the law and ethics and professionalism and courtesy, but subject to that, the clients come first. Thank you very much. That's a very good point to, to end on, I think. Unless you have one more minute, give you some rebuttal time, or <laughs> you can start the next case. I, I'm, I'm happy. There doesn't seem to be that much to rebut. Um, although I'm sure there are plenty of things that the, the panelists were kind enough not to say. Uh, just, quick, just to qu very quickly follow up, because I think it dovetails nicely into the rest of the opinions this, uh, that we'll discuss this afternoon. Um, uh, this this uh, theme that, in, particularly in Judge Wakes and Ms. Mahoney's comments about uh, the relationship between the CLS organization at Hastings and the national organization, and, and who was fueling what, and, and the like. Um, it, sort of taking a very bird's eye view, this, this case and the others uh, re reflect a really interesting uh, inversion of the rhetoric about, constitu about uh, constitutional litigation and pursuing political change through litigation that has been very much in the uh, public discourse since the Warren Court days. Uh, and, and, now, and now I think it's very difficult to maintain that uh, public interest litigation is the exclusive preserve of the left as they continue to lose out in the political theater 
and have to pursue their, their desired changes through, through litigation. As the court, at least by its perception, tilts to the right, uh, I think this kind of social change litigation is more and more something that's, uh, that's open to everyone. It's more and more an ecumenical practice. And I think that that poses very difficult problems for a lot of the rhetoric about originalism and judicial restraint that evolved as a critique to the Warren Court. And we can see that um, arising in some of the other opinions. It's a great segue into the next case, I think. The next case this afternoon is McDonald versus Chicago. Two years ago, in District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment guarantees an individual right to bear arms. It struck down a Washington, D.C. statute that prohibited the possession of handguns within city limits. In so doing, the court aroused a long dormant amendment from its lengthy slumber. Chicago, in one of its suburbs, Oak Park, had handgun bans that were virtually indistinguishable from the District of Columbia's. The same lawyer who won the Heller suit uh, sued to void the Chicago ban. To someone unlettered in American constitutional law, McDonald versus Chicago would strike, would seem an easy case. Chicago's ban was the same as the District of Columbia's. The District of Columbia's violated the Second Amendment, hence Chicago's violated the Second Amendment as well. But this appealingly simple syllogism overlooks one of the essential timbers in the American constitutional structure. As the Supreme Court held in 1833, the Bill of Rights, at least directly, only applies to restrict the power of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis individuals. Insofar as we enjoy constitutional protections from state and local governments, we do so because the 14th Amendment incorporates uh, some of these rights, uh, such that the Bill of Rights restrictions, or at least some of them, are applicable as against the states. Hence the quite difficult question in McDonald's whether the 14th Amendment incorporates the Second Amendment to apply it against the states. With McDonald, it's hard to know where to begin. The opinions amount to a riveting, and I don't say that with, with no intended cynicism or irony, a riveting 100-page distillation of 14th Amendment jurisprudence and its oftentimes turbulent uh, as unsettled history. The opinions include eloquent and not so eloquent defenses and critiques of the method of constitutional interpretation known as originalism. The opinions include Justice Stevens' valedictory, a tour de force that attempts a fundamental reworking of 14th Amendment jurisprudence. Confronted with such riches, I cannot help but identify only a few things to say uh, and let the panelists uh, flesh out your McDonald education. The facts of this case are quite easy. Chicago had essentially the same handgun ban as the District of Columbia did, essentially uh, refused to permit anyone to possess a handgun within city limits. So the question is whether the Second Amendment applies to void this ban, uh, 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 applies through the 14th Amendment to void this ban. So the main question, does the 14th Amendment extend the Second Amendment's protection of an individual right to possess firearms, including handguns, to safeguard individuals against state and local governments? Because of an oddity of 14th Amendment jurisprudence, the main, this main question subdivides into two sub-questions. To someone unversed in constitutional law, this, this question would seem to require an interpretation of the 14th Amendment's Privileges and Immunities Clause. The Privileges and Immunities Clause provides that a state may not abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. It was generally understood in, 18, in the 1860s that privileges and immunities was another way of saying rights. So the Privileges and Immunities Clause essentially seems to incorporate the Bill of Rights, the pri rights of the United, citizens of the United States as against a state and local governments. If rights in the Bill of Rights are indeed considered privileges and immunities of American citizens, then the 14th Amendment should extend their protections, including the Second Amendment to the states. But in the Slaughterhouse cases in 1873, the Supreme Court turned the Privileges and Immunities Clause into uh, a constitutional flot sand, to quote Justice Scalia, or an ink blot, to quote uh, Robert Bork. Privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States included only citizens' abilities to interact with the federal government. Thus, for example, a state could not interfere with someone's ability to access a post office. But that's basically all the clause does, which is odd given how much debate it caused in Congress. So the first sub-question is, should the court reinvigorate the Privileges and Immunities Clause from its 140-year uh, dormancy? If no, the second question then becomes, should the court conclude that the Second Amendment is incorporated into the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause? The Due Process Clause provides that a state may not deprive someone of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. It's a much more textually awkward way to extend the Bill of Rights protections as against the states. But because of the Slaughterhouse cases and a couple of other cases uh, 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 that were issued during Reconstruction when the Supreme Court seemed uh, uh, to try to uh, destroy the efforts by um, the, uh, the radical Republicans to, um, uh, to come up with a more powerful federal government, uh, because of these cases, due process is the only avenue open to do so, to incorporate the Second Amendment. And hence, it was the avenue chosen by the United States Supreme Court over and over again, especially in the Warren Court days, to extend these rights as against the states. <clears throat> 
There are five opinions in this case. Justice Alito wrote a plurality opinion for himself, the chief, Justice, and Justices Kennedy and Scalia. Justice Scalia wrote a concurrence, as did Justice Thomas. Uh, so there are five votes to strike down Chicago's ban and incorporate the Second Amendment. Justice Stevens wrote a solo dissent, and Justice Breyer wrote a, another dissent on behalf of himself and Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg. Justice Alito wrote the plurality opinion concluding that the Due Process Clause does indeed incorporate the Second Amendment. First, he declined the invitation to wake, awaken the Privileges and Immunities Clause from its 140-year-old nap. He did so despite the general opinion that it was written precisely to extend, if not the Bill of Rights themselves, at least things akin to the Bill of Rights uh, to the states. There was no need to disrupt history, Justice Alito said, since the Due Process Avenue remained open for the Second Amendment to travel. Second, Justice Alito canvassed the history of due process incorporation doctrine to distill a test from it. Whether the Second Amendment applies to the states depends on whether, quote, the right to keep and bear arms is fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty, which Justice Alito equated to the following, whether this right is deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. It's important to note the equivalence that Justice Alito drew between, quote, fundamental to our scheme of ordered liberty and, quote, deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition. You would be surprised to know that much of this decision, much of the hundred some odd page of this decision, we're really arguing about gay rights in Lawrence versus Texas. I don't know the necessary connection between handguns and gay rights, but I guess there is one. The formulation that Justice Alito chose would, for example, enable him to claim that Lawrence versus Texas was wrongly decided. Third, Justice Alito answered his own test in the affirmative. Self-defense is a basic right as recognized from ancient times to the present, and guns are the preferred firearm for protecting oneself. Justice Alito hits on some high points from the, uh, about colonial times from the Heller decision. He then stresses the experience of freed slaves in the South right after the Civil War, the terror that they lived under, and the recognition by the authors of the 14th Amendment, uh, uh, that they, uh, the recognition of the authors of the 14th Amendment that they needed firearms to defend themselves as evidence that the authors of the 14th Amendment intended to protect citizens, including those newly freed slaves, by vesting them with a right to individually possess firearms. Justice Scalia concurred basically to defend his method of originalism against Justice Stevens' critique and to insist that any other method uh, of constitutional interpretation smacks of untrammeled judicial activism. Now, interestingly, Justice Scalia did not, did not, adopt, did not adopt the Privileges and Immunities Avenue. He, he said, I will accept that the Privileges and Immunities Avenue is closed to us, even though I'm doubtful that uh, the court interpreted it correctly in the slaughterhouse cases. So even as he defends his originalist methodology, he accepts that an unoriginalist method of incorporating the, fourth, of the Second Amendment through the Due Process Clause uh, is, is the only way to, to go. Um, Justice uh, uh, Scalia wanted to prove, as he said in 2008, that while he's an originalist, he's not a nut. Justice Thomas, on the other hand, is a nut because he accepted the privileges and immunities argument and wrote a, a, a concurring opinion to argue that it should be reinvigorated and awoken uh, from its uh, lengthy slumber. Justice Stevens wrote an eloquent dissent. Justice Stevens denied that there exists something called incorporation at all. What the court was doing in its so-called incorporation cases was really something called substantive due process. If I have to give a basic introduction to substantive due process in addition to everything else I have to do today, my head will explode in nine different directions. Uh, but basically, the question is whether the 14th Amendment itself guarantees an individual right to possess firearms. The, the protection of liberty in the 14th Amendment guarantees a number of fundamental rights, Justice Stevens says. Uh, uh, some of these are mentioned in the Bill of Rights, some are not. The question is whether something analogous to the Second Amendment right is one of these substantive due process protections. There's no time to do justice to Stevens' remarkable reconstruction of substantive due process doctrine. This is just to say that I take his opinion as an effort to provide a workable framework not dependent on some narrow originalism of this all-important constitutional doctrine. Finally, Justice Breyer took on the plurality on its own terms and concludes that the Second Amendment is not in fact incorporated. Before I close, let me suggest one way in which this opinion reflects how law and politics are a continuum and not a dichotomy. Several prominent legal historians have argued that the Supreme Court tends to track political opinion quite closely and that its individual rights jurisprudence is a particularly illustrative phenomenon, a, a, a example of this phenomenon. Consider how public attitudes regarding gay rights changed between Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986 and Lawrence versus Texas in 2008 to use a case that was obviously quite important uh, to the justices as they drafted this, this opinion. In 1986, 55% of Americans favored laws prohibiting homosexual relations. In 2003, 60% of Americans favored laws legalizing homosexual relations, a fact that I'm sure was not lost on the members of the majority in the Lawrence versus Texas case. 
Consider how public attitudes regarding segregation changed between 1927, when the court approved segregated schools in Gong Lum versus Rice, and 1954, when it voided segregation in Brown versus Board. In 1927, we had yet to fight a world war against a, a, a forces of racial oppression. In 1954, we are enmeshed in a legal global, str sorry, global struggle against the Soviet Union, fighting for the hearts and minds of the third world. In 1954, Jackie Robinson was one of the country's most popular athletes, in spite of the fact that in 1927, he would not have been allowed anywhere near the baseball diamond. McDonald reflects the same relationship between political and jurisprudential change. Almost half of Americans surveyed in the late 1980s supported a ban on ownership of handguns. In 1990, the former Chief Justice Warren Burger went around calling the idea that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess firearms one of the greatest pieces of fraud on the American public I have ever seen in my lifetime. In 2008, in contrast, 73% of Americans believe that we have a right to own handguns. I think that uh, I'm not suggesting a facile connection between changed public opinion and uh, the, the way the Supreme Court decides cases, but I think it's an important fact to keep in mind as you evaluate the grand scope of uh, constitutional history. Thank you again, Professor Marcus. Um, Judge Wake, what do you think the significance of Justice Thomas's concurrence in, in his reliance on the Privileges and Immunities Clause is? Well, first let me say that uh, the, I agree with Professor Marcus. This is a grand case. If you put aside whether you like or dislike the outcome about handguns, it is a grand case in, in its summation of the evolution of history of uh, incorporation or the meaning of due process under the 14th Amendment and a revisitation of the slaughterhouse cases. Um, the, um, the slaughterhouse cases are just wonderful. It's, uh, we, we didn't touch on the merits, but briefly, a bunch of people went out and bribed the Louisiana legislature openly to grant themselves a monopoly on, on slaughtering in the city of New Orleans. And the people who were driven out of business um, you know, were unhappy about that. Uh, as it turned out, the bribery was so open that some of the bribers uh, defaulted on their on their allotted shares uh, to the bribery, and some of the people who had advanced the money sued the defaulting bribers in state court for their for their defaulted shares, and 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 the state court said that this is too much even for Louisiana. <laughs> so they threw that case out. But later on, when the statute came through, the Louisiana Supreme Court said, "Well, that's what the legislature said, and that's how it got to the Supreme Court." And as we know, the Supreme Court, when they got there, were simply um, unable to envision a world different from the world before the 14th Amendment. Um, every, what they, virtually everything that they said about the 14th Amendment has since been overruled. And everything they said about the slaughterhouse cases, I, I mean, about the Privileges and Immunities Clauses is not everything, but a lot of it has just been left. So my, and, and as everyone has said, there's been a lot of scholarly interest in this in recent years. I think Justice Thomas was right in the abstract as he is on a variety of things that he is willing to leap beyond where the law has gone and go back to where it should have been. That as a matter of historical purpose, he's probably right. I'm not saying I would agree with him that that makes an automatic incorporation of all of the Bill of Rights. I think that's problematic even for a privileges and immunities clause analysis. But the problem is that uh, the law is a river that cuts its own channel over time. And we've got you know, more, 130 years of, of, of a channel cut in the law here. And obviously the majority uh, thought it's, it is too much work to go through a massive paradigm shift that would affect so much jurisprudence. Now, your question, Sally, what do I think? I, I'm going to offer the thought that it doesn't really matter much. Now, the, 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 plura uh, or, 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 uh, um, the plurality opinion uh, basically, I think, has a, a, a thesis that's basically a traditional incorporation theory, but really with the Bill of Rights on steroids. You're really paying a lot of attention to the Bill of Rights, although there are some of the Bill of Rights that are, have never been incorporated and wouldn't be even under this analysis. And Justice Thomas pretty much comes to the same conclusion, very strong. It's almost like uh, Hugo Black Light, where it's heavily on the Bill of Rights, but not total incorporation. Um, I s submit that the reality is that 
having gone down what is probably the wrong channel uh, way back in the slaughterhouse cases and then having gone through a long time of resurrecting or creating a, a new vision of, of due process, the court has constructed a lot with a thin text. And it has been relying on things like fundamental principles of justice and whatnot, uh, fundamental to our system of justice, that relies on judicial judgment about the nature of our society, of our vision of justice, and that re requires judicial choice. You, you can't get around the judicial choice. I submit that Justice Thomas's view would do a lot of the same. You would still be having to fall back on what is judicial choice and judgment that lacks this illusion of certainty from the text that Justice Scalia and others, uh, and just Hugo Black in particular, uh, thought that could be found. So that's my long answer. I don't think it would make much practical difference in the outcome. Tina Sorrell? One thing that was talked about beforehand um, was that if you locate a right in the Privileges or Immunities Clause, it doesn't attach to corporations or aliens. And so you really only have four votes for the Second Amendment being incorporated um, um, in a way that would apply to aliens and, and corporations' right to uh, bear arms. Um, and then that's, um, you know, interesting. Will it, will it matter? I don't think it will. Do, does the fact that it was a plurality opinion, is it going to really make a difference in terms of how local officials interpret their responsibilities, that it was four votes, not five? I don't think so. Here's what I think um, should matter, and, um, and it would be the implication for constitutional theory. To look at, in good faith, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and to take seriously the argument that it's the better home for these rights than the Due Process Clause, um, which many people, bipartisan, have concluded and to reject it as the court did here and for the conservative justices to reject it I think you could say um, and this is where it's good to be a professor and, and not a practitioner or a judge this is the death of all but the faintest faintest beating heart of originalism be gone that's the end of you and here's why it's the end of you you can't say that the reason that we're going to reject looking at this text is because there's been this intervening period. What, where, when's it enough? 100 years, 15 years, 20 years. We've been getting it wrong. We have this body of case law. It'd be just too much work for us to dig out from under this. I agree 100% with the court's conclusion. Before the case was ever uh, decided, Justice Scalia was here and it was clear um, uh, that where he was going just in a small conversation about it. It doesn't make sense. So what does that mean? In 1997, Jeff Rosen said, we're all originalists now. It was right after Justice Scalia had delivered the Tanner lectures and he'd written his book. But in fact, if here in 2010, if we check in on the originalist project, first it is, there are multiple versions of it. And the people who are now claiming the mantle of being originalists are people like Larry Tribe, and um, uh, other so-called or, or more described liberal Balkan, et cetera, uh, jurists. We've seen a, a 13 years of judges like Justice Souter uh, going after the original intent arguments toe to toe. Uh, we saw it in Heller where the majority opinion and the minority opinion took the originalist historical arguments went toe to toe. And in this case, likewise, we'll see it again in Citizens United toe to toe. Nobody is moved. It doesn't, in fact, end up being determinative. It's evidence. It's relevant. But ultimately, to make sense of these original documents requires a kind of practical perspective about what law is. And it also requires a kind of expertise that most uh, judges, lawyers, and the justices themselves lack. Um, you know, true historians disagree with each other. And the history on the Privileges or Immunities Clause is rich and inconclusive. So had they gone to the Privileges or Immunities Clause, not only would it, it, would it, might it not have mattered in the way Judge Wake says, but they would have been going down the, the uh, uh, rabbit hole of confusion about which historian's account of what these rights look like should we credit. And choices among those accounts have subjectivity um, all over it as well. What has happened with this, the fact that it is Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas on the court? What's happened is we've been revocabularized. It's like Freud. 
uh, everybody can talk like Freud, but that doesn't make you a psychoanalyst. Or, um, in, a, in a more pertinent to law way, um, economics. Um, we, people talk about the relationships using language of cost benefit, sunk costs, uh, et cetera, and, and, and I think that what's happened is lawyers have had to become much more fundamentally revocabularized as historians and to use and draw these texts into the argument, um, but I would submit that it's no more radical to draw history into it uh, than, it's, than it's radical to bring in social science. Um, it is ultimately more external to law. That's the definition um, of when the legal realists were looking at uh, what they think a judge does that it might be external to law and that's problematic and that's radical. My point is I think drawing history into it doesn't make it any less radical, any more coherent, any more predictable, any more stable, or any less activist. And the proof of it, I think, will become clear when we get to Citizens United and the Elena Kagan confirmation hearings. Wasn't it interesting? Everybody accused everybody of activism. And, and the, in the his, historical trope doesn't do anything to prevent that from being part of the discourse now. So I think that McDonald is the best case that I would cite here to for against static forms of originalism. Common law, constitutionalism, evolutionary approach to law happens. See example McDonald. This is constitutional dynamism on stilts. How else does due process of law become the First Amendment? How? How else does post-18th century evolution of thinking about gun possession become the best theory to support the Second Amendment individual right to bear arms? It's like a reverse dynamism constructionism. And um, so I don't think that plain meaning originalism has the break or provides the break that um, they hope. Judicial restraint is only a virtue if it serves an underlying goal worth preserving. It's substantive, the notion that we care about judicial restraint. And the search for historical text to anchor you is a way in which those who think plain meaning originalism is the answer, and I'm quoting Roberto Unger, you are worshiping at cold altars. See example, McDonald, in which Scalia's not even with you in church. Ms. Mahoney? <laughs> 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 um, I actually didn't think that McDonald was um, a surprising case at all. It was just hell. I, I, Heller was the case. It was decided, and once Heller was decided, you knew what the answer was going to be in McDonald. Um, it, the only thing that people, that there was a buzz about was would the court do something that was more radical and, and basically remake the law and go down the privileges and immunities path. Uh, but it, it, there, there's a difference between, of course, originalism as a theory of constitutional interpretation and stare decisis. And, and really what the um, plurality was saying is, um, despite a scholarly presentation by Justice Thomas, we're, we're not gonna go there for reasons of stare decisis in effect without doing the full analysis. But the decision is interesting, I agree with you, that it, uh, because this is all a defense of Heller, really, and the defense of different styles of constitutional interpretation, it, for constitutional law students in particular, I think reading these decisions is a great way to get a real handle on what the debate is between um, the different ideological factions of the court. Because, I mean, Scalia puts it this way at, at one point. He says, really the difference here is a theory, mine, that makes the traditions of our people paramount versus vague ethico-political first principles, which is what uh, the other side relies upon. And others can say, well, you know, that's just bunk. But Justice Scalia does point out that, okay, history um, may not tell you the answer for sure. It may be ambiguous in various settings. And many would say that that's true in Heller, all, although he would say it's not. But he says sometimes it's absolutely clear what the answer is if you allow uh, history to be the guide to how you would interpret the Constitution. And an example of that would be for those who would say that the death penalty is flat out cruel and unusual punishment, how can you say that when at the time of the uh, adoption, uh, the death penalty was of course uh, in vogue and was specifically referenced in the Constitution? So history and tradition does do a lot of work in many cases 
that if you abandon that and say it's not relevant and just go with instead some sort of contemporary notions of, of, of justice, um, you're going you're gonna to have a very different form of constitutional interpretation. So I, I think it's, it's a really useful thing to read um, and to, just to see where they're, where they're coming from. And he does make this point repeatedly. I, I'm not so sure he does it in this, this opinion, but think hard about what it means if you say that constitutional interpretation should be governed by just sort of a contemporary sense of justice, both here and abroad, what does that do to the provision of the Constitution that says uh, what needs to be done to amend it? That you have to have you know, three quarters of the states and, um, and go through this process. If instead justices have been empowered to just decide sort of what the public consent consensus is in their view right now, haven't you really written that out of the Constitution? And these are, these are very hard problems, and I think that the decisions in this case actually uh, nicely sort of spell out the debate. Thank you. Well, I'm going to throw this out to whoever on the panel would like to answer it, but there's been some criticism of the court's decision in Heller, which we would agree McDonald is really about Heller, as as being, some have compared it to Roe v. Wade in the sense of it being an example of judicial overreach. Anyone care to take that one on? Well, I, I'm, I wouldn't call it overreach, but I think it's fair to say that um, reading Heller, um, the evidence is inconclusive there's a lot to be said on both sides. And that w when I read both opinions say, that sounds right. Um, so th then the question may become, if things are inconclusive, um, what are the default um, values that the court should follow in, in deciding these questions? So I, I don't give you an answer, but um, it um, it's, it's, a, it's a significant substantive uh, decision. Professor Marcus? Yeah, sure. I think it depends on how you define overreach. If you define overreach as sort of purely legal overreach, then I think the argument is, is quite strong that Heller and then um, its derivative, derivative is an, an not, not in a pejorative sense, but derivative opinion in McDonald is a, a sort of a conservative analog to Roe in the sense of judges you know, putting their own imprint on uh, uh, an ambiguous text with, uh, with um, conflicting evidence. If you think of overreach, uh, if you situate the, the decision sort of in the political moment more generally, which is obviously the theme I'm trying to push this afternoon, then I have a hard time seeing how Heller is the equivalent of Roe versus Wade. Um, the, the, in retrospect, um, uh, it seems as if Roe versus Wade uh, uh, is sort of, it, 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 it kind of cut off a certain um, political movement towards gaining some of the rights that the decision uh, protects, constitutionalizes through the legislative process. That's the sort of the, the a typical um, legal process critique of Roe versus Wade. Um, now, it's hard. That's retro, that's 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 retrospect um, from 40 years uh, later. In 1970, in the 70, in the early 70s, when Roe was decided, uh, it wasn't. It didn't. Wasn't until the end of the 70s that that evangelical Christians saw Roe versus Wade as a as an issue that they wanted to rally against. In fact, when the decision was first announced, uh, most evangelical groups were silent on that issue. Uh, because the Catholics were against Roe versus Wade, and anything the Catholics were against, the evangelical Christians were for. Um, so I may be wrong about my assessment of Roe, uh, but it's hard to see that Heller is, and Heller and then McDonald are going to um, serve the same function as cutting off some kind of incipient political movement. It's almost impossible to imagine a mainstream candidate for president these days at running on a position of strict gun control. President Obama certainly hasn't. Uh, and I, I know of no major political candidate and major political uh, force in any of the, in either of the houses of Congress who's advocating for strict gun control either. Um, and so I don't see, I th it seems like this is an, an example of an opinion that arrives after the political moment crests rather than before it as, as arguably is what happened in Roe versus Wade. If I could just speak to that, I think that maybe what you're seeing is not so much the jurisprudence of the majority of the court being uh, correlating with popular opinion, but rather that there tends to be a correlation between the jurisprudence of Justice Kennedy and, uh, and public consensus. And he gives credence to that in a variety of areas. He, he tends to be the swing vote in, in all of these cases. 
and in many of the cases where he has sided with the liberal wing of the court, for instance, on issues like whether or not you can um, uh, imprison juveniles uh, for, for life, um, you know, for crimes that, you know, other than, than murder, uh, that sort of thing. He, um, he will be, uh, I, he'll say that, you know, the, the, the public, you know, sort of the emerging public consensus has some, some bearing on how he interprets the Constitution. So I think it may be you're tracking Justice Kennedy more than the court itself. Dean as well. I agree with, I agree with Dave. I don't see the analogy. Um, um, but backing up to what Maureen said, I don't deny that there's a difference between somebody who starts out with, if I look at history, I get the answer, and somebody who thinks it's irrelevant. I just think it's cartoonish um, on both sides. I don't think that the people associated with originalism, Scalia being a good example of this, not the best example, but an example, in fact, is applying it in the way uh, some people imagine originalism to work. He is better described as a traditionalist, and that's not uh, coterminous. Um, and what my point was is that what we see in McDonald, which I think is correct as a descriptive claim, um, is uh, an evolutionary process, that it's constitutional common law evolutionism that's going on. And that we'd be better off if we got out of the, the, the argument about um, whose, whose fidelity to the Constitution is firmer. A lot of liberal constitutional theorists um, are, are proclaimed, self-proclaimed originalists in that I don't think much of anybody thinks you don't look there as a, as a starting point, that you don't consult history. Question is, what do you do in the crevices and the interstices? And I thought that Justice Kagan answered this beautifully um, you know, this summer, where it came down to it, and she talked about the judgment that goes into those determinations in between one or the other. And um, uh, it, very, it was very... Um, Cardozo-like to me, in which how she um, explicated what she thinks judges do. Scalia himself has said, I cannot deny that stare decisis, which he admits he adheres to, which makes him not a pure originalist, affords some opportunity for arbitrariness. I just attempt to constrain my own use of the doctrine by consistent rules. And if you, if you peel it back just to use him, what is it that he's against? what his approach to the Constitution and constitutional amendment and the theory that Maureen accurately describes is he ends up being against not what he regards as novel constitutional rights. And he thinks we're in the presence of that when we can find a specific historical practice that the framers knew existed when they adopted a rule and didn't think applied to the rule. And he gives us the example, cruel and unusual punishment. He rarely in those addresses, when he talks ab uh, about it, goes to the question, what do we do about the ladies? What about women? You know, what happened? Is that a, uh, something that's just an application like uh, ramped up technology affects what we think about guns? Or, uh, and therefore, our notions of citizens change as we, as, as we expand our concept of it? Um, or is it more like cruel and unusual, this is what we did then, and we should be able to do that to women too? And how you answer that question um, suggests how much evolution you permit, what level of generality, um, you know, how specific does the practice have to be before you call it traditional. Um, and the novel constitutional rights he's against, he doesn't think the Second Amendment as construed as self-defense in the home is novel. There's some evidence that it is. Um, uh, is it the better view they landed in in Heller? I don't think so. Um, do they make, does it make sense to apply it by the 19th century under the eight, uh, 14th Amendment? I do think so as an individual right. I think the post-1787 uh, and, and 89 practices are more illuminating and, and better defense of the individual right to bear arms than anything that existed before the Second Amendment was adopted because of the black codes and because of the violence against uh, the recently emancipated African Americans and also the whites who defended them. But you can't consider that post-adoption history as relevant in, in articulating the meaning of the Second Amendment unless you believe that evolutionary process is relevant to it. And that, that's, that's the point I was making. He's against striking down same-sex schools. He's against protecting same-sex relations. He's against pro uh, uh, protection of abortion and denying government the right to affirm religion writ large. That kind of stuff. 
he regards those as novel constitutional rights. And I think people in good faith can disagree about that. But I don't think you can be a pure originalist and buy into McDonald. Thomas is your last hope. <laughs> Uh, it, Judge Wake? Isn't part of the answer that, that the relevance and strength of originalism in constitutional law varies from obvious and dispositive to attenuated, just as it does in other areas of legislation? So, for example, we're used to interpreting statutes looking for a specific meaning of the, of the legislative, of the legislature, and that's how, the, that's what we usually do. But there's legislation that doesn't work that way. The antitrust laws are essentially a mandate to the courts to create consistent bodies of, of uh, economic, uh, of, of, of rules to promote competition. Um, and why shouldn't, why could not there be the same variation in the Constitution? So, for example, the Constitution says that the House of Representatives shall consist of members apportioned to the states and according to their population. That sounds like the paradigm of an originalist term of the Constitution. It's actually an open to debate now it's because uh, Congress came close to adding a voting representative from the District of Columbia, which is not a state. But there are other provisions, whether it's the Privilege and Immunities Clause or Equal Protection that if it are simply um, you can't pin it down to what people were thinking about in 1868. The as you said, Tony, the materials are diverse, and there's a rich body of secondary materials on the history of the 14th Amendment, and you read it all and various stuff. And lots of people had lots of ideas, and it's really hard to say what the legislatures, three fourths of the legislatures, were thinking when they ratified it. So perhaps things like equal protection and privilege and immunities are on that somewhere, not on the easy end of the spectrum of determining original intent, and somewhere down the spectrum of entrustment to a cautious judicial uh, rationalization in current circumstances. Nice summary, Judge Wake. And on that note, um, we're going to take a break. And uh, for about 10 minutes, I think there's water outside if you want to get up and stretch your legs. And we'll reconvene at 335.
you're feeling somewhat uh, worn out by, uh, it's the mid-afternoon, you might be feeling a little bit tired. We've been talking about the Supreme Court for a couple of hours now. There's no way to energize you better than, talk of, than to talk about Free Enterprise Fund versus Public Company Accounting <laughs> Oversight Board. <laughs> the Free Enterprise case, in some sense, reflects the central tension in American administrative law. We want agency administrators to act with technical competence and expertise, but we're fearful of agency power not subject to political checks. The opinion in this case tries to straddle this tension, produces an unwieldy answer, but one that I think is ultimately a pragmatic one. Formally, the case involves limits on the president's power to dismiss members of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or PICABU, as I'll call it, or I think others call it too, an agency working under the aegis of the Securities and Exchange Commission. But, but more broadly, the case in some sense involves uh, much more fundamental questions. And I think it makes the most sense if we talk about three background subjects. First, independent agencies. Second, the law that regulates independent agencies. And third, the theory of the unitary executive. So what exactly are administrative agencies? The United States Constitution provides for three branches of government, as we all know. So where do agencies fit? It's tempting to say, well, let's just look to Article 2, Section 1, which provides that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States. We often think of agencies as executive branch institutions, subject ultimately to the control of the president, and thus fitting comfortably within Article 2. But this, and while this is true for plenty of agencies like, say, the Department of Defense, it is simply not the case for others, like the SEC. There are plenty of so-called independent agencies, of which the SEC is an example. The SEC has five commissioners, each of whom is appointed to a five-year term. The terms are staggered, so no president could possibly appoint all SEC commissioners. The president, and moreover, the president can only dismiss an SEC commissioner upon a showing of good cause, uh, not at will, as is the case for other department heads. In other words, a commissioner can only be dismissed on grounds of inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office, and not because he or she pursues policies. The president, as leader of the executive branch, and in theory responsible for executing the securities laws, uh, disagrees with. The SEC, in other words, is an independent agency. Its, its officers are not uh, removable at will by the president. The agency itself is not totally subject to presidential control. Independent agencies have existed since the 1880s, but we have yet to come to exactly to constitutional grips as to what they are, where they fit within the terms of the Constitution. The law regarding independent agencies does little to clarify their constitutional status. In 1926, Chief Justice Taft, who of course had been president himself, insisted that, uh, that all heads of agencies must be subjected to presidential control and that presidents must have uh, uh, complete authority to remove uh, the heads of agencies. But nine years later, in the midst of the New Deal, explosion in the size of the American administrative state, the court appeared to reverse course. In Humphrey's Executor versus United States, a 1935 decision, the court held that Congress could restrict the power of the president to remove members of the Federal Trade Commission because those members exercise quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial powers. The FTC promulgates rules, which is like promulgating legislation. The FTC holds administrative hearings, which is like deciding cases. The FTC, in other words, is not wholly executive, so it could not, it's not squarely part of the executive branch subject to presidential control. More recently, the Supreme Court has gone out of its way to uphold restrictions on presidential power. In Morrison versus Olson, a 1988 case, the court upheld the independent counsel statute. The independent counsel statute was one of the Watergate reforms designed to protect against the excesses of the Nixon administration. Uh, the most famous appointee to this, uh, to this position, of course, was Ken Starr, more about him in a minute. The law provides that the Attorney General could only remove an independent counsel for good cause. Uh, this law was challenged, and the court stressed that since the President could remove the Attorney General at will, essentially the, the President essentially could wield some modicum of power over the independent counsel, him or herself. The law did not, quote, unduly interfere with the President's exercise of executive power. In academia, particularly among those who insist on an originalist reading of the Constitution, cases like Morrison are an anathema. These scholars insist upon a unitary theory of the executive. Agencies like the FTC and independent counsel undoubtedly execute the laws. The Constitution recognizes the president as having plenary power to uh, execute the laws. There is a unitary executive in the Constitution, not one divided between uh, the president and so-called independent agencies. Thus, as a matter of simple constitutional law, the president must have unfettered control over the agencies, including control to remove agencies' head at his or her discretion. One can describe advocates and opponents of the unitary executive theory as arguing over a very basic idea about the administrative state. 
Should ours be an administrative government dominated by expertise and technical competence, an ideal that requires some political insulation in order to work? Or should our administrative state be politically accountable through presidential elections, a status that sacrifices technical prowess to democratic legitimacy? The free enterprise case gave some hope to advocates of the unitary executive theory that the Supreme Court would get rid of cases like Humphrey's executor and Morrison versus Olson and embrace their quite expansive view of presidential power. But unlike in Citizens United, which we'll talk about later, the court balked at such a, a fun, dramatic remaking of the American governmental fabric. In the wake of major accounting scandals involving Enron and WorldCom, scandals that seemed quaint uh, after the 2008 recession, Congress created the peekaboo as part of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. It's not worth, worth going into the details, but essentially peekaboo basically promulgates accounting and auditing standards uh, that, and can inspect auditing accounting firms. If it finds irregularities, it can uh, essentially commence criminal prosecutions and the like. Here's the key. Peekaboo is led by a board of five members appointed to staggered five-year terms. Peekaboo's members, and appointed by, me, uh, by the SEC commissioners. Peekaboo's members can only be removed by SEC commissioners upon a showing of good cause. Here's the trick. SEC commissioners themselves can only be removed by the president upon a showing of good cause. In other words, there are two layers of good cause protection guarding against the president removing uh, uh, Peekaboo board members uh, if he or she wants. It would be one thing if the president could directly remove Peekaboo's members for good cause. This would be Humphrey's executor. It would be another thing if the president could remove SEC commissioners for good, for at will and if they could remove Peekaboo members for good cause. This would be Morrison versus Olson. But here are two levels of good cause protection, making it quite difficult for the president to exercise any meaningful control over Peekaboo board members. An accounting firm subject to an enforcement action claimed that this Peekaboo structure interfered with the president's executive power. Ironically, the accounting firm was represented by Ken Starr, who earlier had been appointed pursuant to the independent counsel statute to the independent counsel position. Uh, so he, was, he benefited from uh, this, the Morrison versus Olson case, which enabled him to embark on a multi-year uh, investigation into the vast ambiguities and uh, mysteries of oral sex. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts, writing for the majority of five conservative justices, agreed that the peekaboo structure violated the Constitution. There's some language in the opinion that suggests that Roberts would love to have embraced the unitary executive theory. The problem isn't the double four-cause layer uh, of protection, but rather that agencies cannot be independent of the president. But Roberts doesn't go this far. Uh, he says one layer of four-cause removal restrictions is fine. It's okay if there are some restrictions on the president's power to remove officials. But two layers of good cause protection is too much. The president could believe that a peekaboo member was neglectful of his or her duties, but if the SEC, SEC commissioners don't do anything, uh, there's nothing that the president could do. The president cannot remove an SEC commissioner at will who refuses to remove a peekaboo board member, and the president cannot remove the peekaboo board member himself directly. This double layer of insulation strips the president of the ability to execute the laws by holding his subordinates accountable for their conduct and is thus unconstitutional. So we're left with a clear rule of law, if somewhat of an anomalous one. Independent agencies are fine so long as there's only one layer of good cause protection for their uh, heads. But while this is ostensibly in the name of presidential power, it leaves quite an odd result in this case. It's now understood that the SEC commissioners have the power to remove peekaboo board members at will. The president can remove SEC commissioners, but only for cause. So if a peekaboo member does what the president wants, but SEC commissioners don't want, there is nothing the president can do if the commissioners remove the peekaboo board member, provided the commissioners are not committing some sort of malfeasance. At any rate, the opinion in my mind represents a necessary, inelegant compromise between two visions of an administrative state. The opinion preserves a modicum of good cause protection for the agency administrators in the name of technical efficiency. But it insists upon a modicum of presidential control in the name of democratic legitimacy. What results is an odd structure that doesn't really make sense by this metric or any metric but makes ample sense in this particular instance, but it makes ample sense as a manifestation of a compromise between democracy and technical expertise, a compromise born not of any text in the Constitution, the Constitution, after all, does not provide for independent agencies, but out of political and bureaucratic necessity. Thank you, Professor Marcus. And my first question goes to you, why is this case important? <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I asked that myself a few nights ago when I was struggling to um, make my way through uh, the arcane details. It's actually uh, really important for, for two reasons. Um, one, as a as matter of purely administrative law, 
is important for its uh, very tepid embrace of the unitary executive theory. Uh, basically, administrative law now is, is very clear as to how heads of agencies can be controlled by other, by either Congress or the President. We now know as a clear rule that, the, that Congress cannot control the actions of, of administrative agencies. Once they delegate power to administrative agencies, that's it, it's over. They cannot retain some, some control short of formal legislation to control the activities of agencies. We also know that they can create structures by which they protect agencies from presidential heavy handedness. So they can create independent agencies that, uh, that uh, can function somewhat independent of presidential control and we know what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. So that's, that's, that's important for the structuring of these independent agencies going forward. As a political, or I, I use the term political and I think we might have a disagreement about what this means uh, in, in the short future, uh, but as a uh, political, um, uh, political science -y, uh, uh, reason. I think it's significant because of its, its only tepid embrace the unitary executive theory. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, discussion of this theory of the unitary executive uh, during the Bush administration um, uh, as this sort of very dangerous, threatening uh, theory that if brought into by the Supreme Court would vest the president with uh, you know, these, these, this remarkable amount of power to do whatever it wants. Um, I don't, I don't think, I think that's a bit of an exaggeration, but that, that was sort of the political overtones of this notion of the theory of the unitary executive. This case, basically, it, it, the court had, a, had an opportunity to embrace the theory, declined to do so. I think that um, the idea that the president himself will enjoy total power to execute the laws in the future is unlikely to happen, and in all likelihood, this case uh, is tantamount to, repu to a repudiation of the sort of full extent of that theory. Ms. Mahoney? Uh, I, I think it, it is hard to read the decision and say that there's something really satisfying doctrinally about uh, about the opinion and about the ruling because for, for reasons that Professor Marcus has described, you know, what, why does this really make a huge difference in a, in a lot of fact patterns? But I think that for uh, those who believe in robust executive power, in other words, uh, and, and certainly uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist was one of them, who, who read Article Two as saying it is the president's responsibility to faith, faithfully execute the laws, uh, they looked at the landscape and said, you know what, uh, this has been eroded through a series of decisions. We're not going to uh, overturn them, but enough is enough. And here we're faced with a new fact pattern uh, that really does mean that the president has essentially, you know, no authority to exercise any removal power, even for good cause, and uh, and that's just a bridge too far. And I think that uh, the fact that the United States, at argument, uh, suggested that even five levels of of uh, for cause removal might still not create an Article II problem was a further incentive for the court to say, we just can't let this one go by. So I, I think, I, I don't know what it's really gonna mean for other fact patterns, but this one, they just said, uh, no more expansion um, of this doctrine that really erodes the president's express textual responsibility for faithful ex execution of the laws. C can I ask you another question with your experience in the SG's office, that here you have this independent agency and the, the SG's office is tasked with defending statutes if there's a reason to think that they're constitutional. But this really is something that maybe the president might have taken a different view and said, no, I think this is, this is unconstitutional. How, how does that play out with the independent agency in the SG's office? Is it the, is it the Department of Justice that makes that decision even if you have an independent agency? Well, um, it depends on the particular statute, but generally speaking, the uh, Solicitor General can allow the independent agency to have their own counsel uh, to represent them in the Supreme Court, uh, you know, decide, in other words, that, uh, that they're, if they have a different view of what the answer might be, they can have a different advocate. And I thought that it was interesting that in the Roberts opinion, he does, in essence, address the issue of why is the president defending the erosion of power in this case, and he essentially says, look, if this president wants to give away his power, uh, you know, 
that that's maybe you know his choice, but we're not bound by it because it's our responsibility to preserve the constitutional authority of the office of the president, regardless of what the views of this president might be. Thank you, Dean Massaro. I think Marine's spot on. I, I think that it's hard to see this is doctrinally. Here's how it'll be anthologized. It'll be put in for the narrow point that Professor Marcus says you can't have the double for cause removal. And then you might have questions after saying, well, speculate, what does this mean? And they'll say, uh, it a bridge too far. But that's an important move. You see, so when early part of substantive due process, you start to see um, the more um, uh, ostensibly conservative justices saying, okay, I'm going to observe stare decisis, but I'm not adding anything to the list. And that is a very important, you know, the flag goes up. Um, uh, also, um, it, Breyer thought it was a very big deal. Um, you know, it's, it, and I think it was, there must have been a lot going on within the court that made it worth his while to file this long with appendices dissent and say that this case's uh, result is wrong, very wrong. Um, he, he saw this as, as, a, as, a, as a big deal. And um, so I think nestled in the undergrowth is, you know, they're, they live to fight another day. And between Everybody agrees it's a unitary executive. The question is how unitary and what do those you know, powers include, a strong, robust version or a narrower version. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is that there were no concurring opinions. I'm not the only one who's observed that. I mean, it's, there, Scalia didn't write separately, and um, so they've got a united front for something, and that something is saying we're not going anymore. Uh, than this, and we think it, it's a pretty powerful statement about executive power while preserving precedent. Um, so, I don't know. Maybe I just said, I don't know. Judge yeah. Wake? <laughs> Judge Wake? Well, I have nothing to subtract and only a little to add to what has been said. Uh, the, uh, you know, Justice Breyer used to teach administrative law at Harvard, so you can see he's beside himself because uh, he knows what he's talking about when he wrote this uh, uh, dissent. Um, this, to me, this looks like a, I phrase it, a, like a warning shot across the bow to Congress. You know, we're not happy with where you, you're headed here. And, and uh, Chief Justice Roberts, his opinion uh, talks uh, powerfully about anxiety, about the unaccountability in the executive branch that, that, that has evolved and uh, it echoes concerns that have been voiced about lack of presidential uh, power to change policy once you get elected. And, and particularly talks about legislative incursions into executive power that, that power doesn't recognize any vacuums and there's concern about Congress intruding. So um, it, I, I read it the same way everyone else has, that it's hard to say concretely what it's gonna mean, but it, it's a sort of a change of tone from the court and a warning to Congress. Let me add a point of com comparative law under the Arizona Constitution. Uh, un unlike the federal constitution, which does not have an express clause about separation of powers, the Arizona constitution does have an express provision that says there shall be separation of powers into the three branches. But also, unlike the federal constitution, the Arizona constitution does not have an appointments clause. The governor is not given the exclusive power to appoint people. So what we have seen in some cases that I know of is that the legislature does flow into this vacuum and the legislature has created bodies with executive authority where they have retained to themselves the authority to appoint people to a body, uh, to a boards. Um, and uh, so Ju Chief Justice Roberts' comment about uh, the, the fears of legislative intrusion, I think are, uh, reflect human nature and the nature of politics and the experience that's happened in, here in Arizona. Uh, one other thing I just would uh, reference about the decision is that in a, in a term when there was a lot of uh, uproar about the court being activist, and we'll get to that in Citizens United, I, I think there wasn't that much said, though, about how restrained the court was with respect to the remedy that they uh, crafted in this case for of the constitutional violation. You know, the litigants, the, the whole purpose of the litigation was to established that the, that the board uh, that was overseeing their activities was unconstitutional and that therefore its actions were, were void. 
And the court didn't buy that at all. Instead, they said, well, this just means that the board members can be discharged at will um, uh, by, the, by the SEC commissioners. So uh, it was really, they found that the provision, um, the, the offensive provision was severable and that the, the statute otherwise remained intact. I, I suspect that the litigants thought this was a, a, um, a major disappointment because I, I don't think that you know, it really mattered all that much to the accounting firm whether the board members could be removed for uh, cause or at will. Um, so it, it was a restrained uh, kind of remedy. Maureen, let me ask you from, about that from the perspective of a lawyer. I would have thought that that would have been obvious, that the remedy would be the least amount necessary to neutralize the, the, the defect. So. What were they thinking? Well, I didn't read all the briefing on this, so, uh, but you know, sometimes severability questions can actually be quite tricky, uh, depending on how the legislation is written and, and those sorts of things. So I, I would imagine that uh, they must have thought they had a real shot at it, uh, otherwise they may not have invested that much in the litigation. Uh, I mean, I, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I doubt this could be viewed as a major victory. Right. Thank you. The Wall Street Journal talked about that expressly, that there wasn't, um, it, they, they thought in, in the article that there wasn't uh, a, a st strong enough evidence of severability. That would have been a big deal. Plus retroactivity um, would have been a big deal. And, you know, it kind of life went on. No one lost <coughs> an eye. Nobody lost a paycheck. Uh, the, the, the chief did let us know how much they make, by the way. You left that out, Professor Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> the members of the, of the who makes them like 600 grand each, which is great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice work if you can get it. Right. <laughs> but they can be discharged at will. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, just, quick, just quickly uh, on the question of significance, there's a, a, a very easy comparison between this case and a case called uh, INS versus Chada, which was decided in the early 1980s. Uh, and that was an, uh, INS versus Chada invalidated the legislative veto, a mechanism by which Congress could required administrative agencies after they promulgated rules pursuant to power Congress delegated to those agencies to send the, the rules to Congress to wait for a period of time. If a, either House of Congress enacted a resolution disapproving of the rule, the rule would not go into effect. And the Supreme Court in a bitterly divided case with a stinging dissent by Justice White uh, invalidated the legislative veto. And there are all sorts of claims in the academic literature and uh, 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 more popular commentary about the INS versus Chadha case that this was the road towards um, sort of agency tyranny. Uh, it was uh, clipping Congress's wings way too much and the, the ramifications of the decision were impossible to figure out and uh, likely to be horrific. Um, that didn't prove to be the case. When I teach this case in my, in my very light version of administrative law class, uh, it's hard for me to t convince the students why it matters, uh, uh, viewed from uh, uh, 28 years later. And I, that's my guess uh, as to what this opinion will amount to, that it's about an arcane way in which Congress structures uh, a, an administrative agency, a way that the President himself, George Bush, the, an advocate of the unitary executive theory, did not notice when he signed the bill. He did not issue a signing statement on this provision, which is very strange given that his Vice President, Dick Cheney, was probably the most aggressive advocate of the unitary executive theory that's ever inhabited that position. So my guess is that this case will probably be something included in administrative law uh, textbooks, case books going forward, but unlikely to have much of a major uh, jurisprudential impact. Thank you. Now it's back to you, Professor Marcus. Citizens United, which struck down limits on corporate campaign expenditures is both a confirmation of and a challenge to my claim about law and politics, at least my claim about the relationship between uh, law and public opinion. On the surface level, it's quite a challenge. One poll taken after the decision found that 80% of Americans disagreed with the result. That included 70%, 76% of Republicans. So there's bipartisan distaste for this decision. On another level, though, the opinions in the case support the idea of law and politics as or law as politics by other means. The majority went well beyond what the particular case required. The voting broke down on five, four ideological lines. The majority opinion refuses to let something as annoying as precedent get in the way 
the majority blithely brushed aside quaint notions of judicial modesty and minimalism. Let me start by doing the impossible and provide a quick and dirty summary of federal campaign finance case law. Uh, I, I stress dirty uh, summary. Buckley versus Vallejo kicked things off in 1976, not dirty in the sort of pornography sense, but uh, uh, in the in inadequate sense. Uh, Buckley versus Vallejo started things off in 1976. Buckley versus Vallejo includes, Vallejo includes two, over 200 pages of exceedingly muddled discussion, but there's a couple of key holdings. Restrictions both on giving and spending money in connection with elections are tantamount to restrictions on speech and can be justified only in the service of compelling government interests. The court held that amounts of campaign contributions could be limited to prevent corruption or the appearance of corruption. There was the real danger of a quid pro quo when someone directly gives money to a candidate. But limits on independent expenditures could not be justified by an anti-corruption interest due to a lack of evidence that independent spending could corrupt candidates. Courts, the court also rejected an equality rationale for limits on expenditures. The idea that some voices could be limited to enhance the voice of others to compensate for inadequacies of wealth or inequalities of wealth is something wholly foreign to the First Amendment, the court concluded. In First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti in 1978, the court struck down limits on expenditures by corporations in ballot measure elections, non-candidate elections. And in an opinion otherwise remarkable for its expansive embrace of corporate free speech rights, the court included an important footnote 26 that provides as follows. Congress might well be able to demonstrate the existence of a danger of real or apparent corruption in independent expenditures by corporations to influence, influence candidate elections. The court elaborated on footnote 26 in an as opinion uh, Austin versus Michigan Chamber of Commerce decided in 1990. In this case, the court upheld electoral spending limits on for-profit corporations in candidate elections. The law was justified to prevent, quote, the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregation, aggregations of wealth that are accumulated with the help of the corporate form. The court described this, described this idea as an anti-corruption justification for the law, but it was really an anti-distortion justification to protect against inequalities of wealth distorting discourse in political elections. Uh, this almost seemed like the equality rationale rejected in Buckley. Austin was reaffirmed in 2002 in McConnell versus FEC. So federal election uh, campaign finance law is uh, incoherent b before Citizens United, but there is this idea in Austin and McConnell that uh, 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 independent expenditures by corporations can be restricted in the interests of some anti-corruption rationale. I'm hopeful this summary will give you an appreciation for just how nakedly the court remade law in Citizens United. As is often true, significant cases are made of fairly silly facts. Citizens United is a far right-wing nonprofit corporation that receives some funding from corporate donors. It's run by a man named David Bossy. Again, uh, the left-wing communist Jewish homosexual pornographer law professor, don't take it from me, take it from George H.W. Bush, who referred to Bossy as, quote, the lowest form of human life. Back in 2007, when everyone, including Hillary Clinton, thought Hillary Clinton would be the next president of the United States, Citizens United, with Bossy at the helm, made a film called Hillary the Movie. It's basically 90 minutes of talking heads trashing Hillary as the greatest socialist threat to American democracy ever. Uh, ha ha, the joke's on Citizens United because the real socialist was in fact elected president. <laughs> Citizens United wanted to make the film available on video on demand, uh, uh, a video on demand channel throughout the primaries and the general election. It would cost Citizens United $1.2 million to do so and it of course would have to advertise its film for it to get uh, an audience. The problem is, is that campaign finance law prohibits corporations and unions from making independent expenditures, that is, expenditures not coordinated with the campaigns themselves, that expressly advocate for defeat or election of a candidate within 30 days of the primary or 60 days of the general. Independent expenditures, again, are those not coordinated with the candidates themselves. Bossy and Citizens United worried about the legality of paying for the video on demand service and the advertisements. So Citizens United brought a declaratory judgment action to get a clean bill of health, arguing that restrictions on corporate independent expenditures, or at least the restrictions as applied in this instance, I stress as applied in this instance, violate the First Amendment. Following Austin and McConnell, the lower court ruled against Citizens United. The case went to the Supreme Court. It was argued twice because the first time Citizens United did not argue that campaign finance law was facially unconstitutional and that Austin and McConnell should be overruled. The justices invited re-argument on, uh, uh, on this question. Solicitor General, then Solicitor General Elena Kagan, in her first appearance before any court, uh, had to defend this cornerstone of federal campaign finance law. Uh, she and I have 
roughly the same experience litigating cases. <laughs> Kennedy allied with the four conservatives to strike down this law as a violation of the First Amendment. All justices were true to form in their opinions. Kennedy writes with his trademark purple prose, crafting a peon to the First Amendment that is full of all sorts of what Justice Stevens describes appropriately as glittering generalities. The chief's concurring opinion confirms my belief that he's the best legal writer since Robert Jackson. Justice Scalia somehow finds in the newsletter of the Society for the Relief and Instruction of Poor Germans in print between 1755 and 1757 answers to all questions, First Amendment and otherwise. And Justice Stevens' lengthy dissent reminds me of his dissent in the Parents Involved case, a creed occur about a court he joined a long time ago that no longer bears a resemblance to what he, uh, what the, a court he joined a long time ago that has changed beyond uh, uh, all recognition. I'll focus on Kennedy's opinion. After a fair amount of brush clearing, uh, to establish that there's no way the court could have decided this case other than to uh, uh, address the facial uh, constitutionality of this prohibition on independent expenditures, Justice Kennedy got down to business. First, he insisted that the expenditure ban is a ban on speech whose purpose is to, quote, silence entities whose voices the government deems to be suspect. Second, Kennedy reiterated a point that is hardly self-evident but nonetheless fairly well established, that corporations have a First Amendment right just as individuals do. Based on these two points, the law would be sub the law, the campaign finance restriction, would be subjected to strict scrutiny and could only survive if there were a compelling justification for it. Third, Justice Kennedy concluded there is no such justification. As for Austin's anti-distortion rationale, that restraints on independent expenditures are necessary to keep corporations from dominating our public discourse, Kennedy noted that Buckley itself found equality in the marketplace of an ideas something foreign to the First Amendment. Another possible ration justification for the restriction has to do with the idea that independent expenditures might cause corruption or the appearance of corruption, as recognized in Bilotti footnote 26 and then reiterated in Austin and McConnell. Kennedy brushes this concern aside. The only corruption that campaign finance laws should concern themselves with, he insists, is explicit quid pro quo corruption. I donate to your campaign, you vote for my desired law. Because this ban targeted independent expenditures, there is no quid pro quo corruption of this sort that can justify a restraint on First Amendment rights. Here's where Kennedy's opinion is breathtaking. When I presented this case to the University of Arizona's first year class this, uh, earlier th uh, in August, 100% of students agreed that a corporation's massive expenditures, even if not coordinated with a campaign, could lead someone once elected to feel obliged to support that corporation's interests is not just obvious to our students, it's also obvious to Justice Kennedy just last term in Caperton versus Massey, where he concluded that massive independent expenditures would lead to the appearance of corruption significant enough to require the recusal of a judge who benefited from such expenditures in, the elect in a, state, uh, court, uh, a, a state Supreme Court uh, uh, campaign. But in Citizens United, Kennedy blithely, brushes, uh, blithely concludes without citing a single empirical source or data point that, quote, independent expenditures, including those made by corporations, do not give rise to corruption or the appearance of corruption. Further, the appearance of influence or access will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy. What empowers a judge to draw such breathtakingly sweeping conclusions so profoundly at odds with common sense is beyond me. I don't have time to discuss the concurring and dissenting opinions, which is too bad because Justice Stevens' opinion is a magnum opus. Particularly good is his criticism of the majority for its cavalier attitude towards stare decisis. Among other justifications, Kennedy explained his disregard for Austin on grounds that it, quote, is undermined by experience since its announcement. As Justice Stevens points out, Kennedy cites nary a single piece of evidence in support of this claim instead referring vaguely to, quote, rapid changes in technology and the creative dynamic inherent in the concept of free expression. As Justice Scalia once said, commenting on a colleague's flights of rhetoric, this is really more than one should have to bear. I've tried this year not to be too cynical in my presentation of these decisions, but it's difficult for me to see how this, this decision is anything other than a naked manifestation of ideology or politics disguised as law. <laughs> what you really think. Um, Dean Massaro, where do we go from here? Um, first, I think that, that, that it was predictable when the court called it back. Nobody really thought um, that something big wasn't going to happen. Second, in fairness to the majority, uh, was the law coherent? before um, this case was decided, no. If you go through, Susanna Sherry thinks, I don't, I don't actually share the view, but she cites this case and Lawrence as two examples of constitutional theory uh, done right. 
and defends it uh, in ter terms of four pillars of legitimate constitutional analysis. Um, uh, there, there was a lot of internal tension. Rick Hasen, who is a very well-known election law specialist, has written lots of, of work on this. It's a hard area to teach because of that internal theoretical, logical tension in the cases. So it isn't entirely true um, uh, that uh, they had undone 100 years of law, and, and that is why when President Obama said it, Justice Alito shook his head no. Um, they, they had undone more recent law. Um, there, there were factual distinctions that could be made between the law decided 100 years ago in this case. Um, but the question, what now, is really an empirical uh, question. I can't help but say, had McDonald been decided differently, that's the Second Amendment case, remember, we were talking about earlier, and they were deciding whether to put it in the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the Second Amendment versus due process. And I said one thing that would happen if they did, if the Second Amendment lives there, neither aliens nor corporations have rights under that provision of the Constitution. If you put the Second Amendment there, I think it would be inescapably the case that the rest of the rights would live there too, and thus would end the strongest argument for corporations to have free speech because under the Privileges or Immunities Clause, they don't enjoy them. I think they would have found a way to give it back, but that's just to, to make sure nobody's gone to sleep. Okay, <laughs> now, what happens next? People who claim to know, I think. Um, I've, I've read a lot, and, and it's, this is an empirical question out, uh, above, way above my pay grade because I don't work for Peekaboo. Um, the, the conduct allowed now in Citizens United was allowed in 26 states before the opinion. What do we know about the relative distortion or corruption in those states? One. Two, the Congress worked uh, hard and immediately to try to do what it could given in the aftermath of the opinion by, by drafting a thing called this close. You may be aware that it was narrowly defeated in a why is worth unpacking partisan vote. Um, it, it was, that was insufficient to overcome a Republican filibuster. Um, the ACLU was very opposed to disclose, by the way, um, and, and concerned about constitutional infirmities of it um, because the opinion seems to endorse part of the opinion that uh, uh, Dave didn't uh, spend as much time on. Disclosure, that's better, right? We voters, as long as we know what's going on, we'll make good choices but maximum disclosure can invade privacy. So a prediction I have is a lot of the work, the constitutional analysis and thinking is going to go to the limits, the constitutional limits on disclosure. And also the practical uh, analysis of whether we'll, if we know more, do we really vote better? In fact, um, technological intervention. Zephyr Teachout has written a great article in which she talks about how a lot of this is really quaint that in fact there are all kinds of ways um, to reach potential voters and influence elections that have nothing to do with uh, traditional forms of electioneering. Another thing that the uh, New York Times and other um, major publications have talked about is anonymous giving that can go through, this is permitted and was before, uh, you can go through since corporations don't really like to be seen as weighing in in partisan elections. It's not good for business often, but they can donate to the Chamber of Commerce, for example. Some of you may have seen that story. And so, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which the how to uh, influence elections apparatus was already in place. And after the opinion, it's unclear to me whether um, uh, the, the elimination of these restrictions is going to make as big a difference as opponents of the case fear. Um, I don't know the answer to it. Um, I do think there's a, there is, uh, where there's a will, there's a way. When it comes to influencing elections, there's a lot of will, and there's a lot of money, and there's a way. Here in Arizona, it may immediately have an impact. There's a case pending. I don't think they've accepted cert yet that will look at the question of post-Citizen United. Is it permissible to have clean elections laws that demand that you match money? If I go uh, clean election um, and you spend individually, this was an issue when uh, John Munger was a candidate and he has been quite eloquent in talking about his objections to this. I spend my own money. Is it constitutionally permissible or does it violate this equalizing principle for the state to give money as I spend, my opponent gets the money. It was an issue in, in the gubernatorial uh, race with, with uh, Governor Napolitano, and I think immediately Citizens United, the logic of it, suggests that Arizona clean elections is in trouble. 
bigger aftermath, First Amendment theory implications. I think it's really easy to, um, I think Kennedy is dewy-eyed in this opinion. Voter perspicuity, um, uh, the odysseus like ability of a legislator to strap him or herself to the mast and slide past the sirens of big bucks and go, oh, I don't mind that you're pro, blah. Um, I think that no American really takes that seriously, and I think that's a problem for the court. Um, and I think it was unnecessary. The First Amendment <laughs> itself has, over the years, evolved into something that's a pragmatic, um, it isn't a, an unbridled, romanticized embrace of a free marketplace of ideas. The, it recognizes marketplace failures. It recognizes distortion in other areas of the law. It recognizes the danger of corruption. Um, and so I think that Citizens United um, will, is vulnerable because in defense of, um, they reached out, and then in defense of, of his conclusions, Kennedy went too far. It's one bromide after another. It's a sta it, one statement after another that if it came, uh, I, I don't want to sound disrespectful, it, you would want to, if someone m gave you a paper with that, so you need to qualify it. You know, there, there needs to be some, some nuance here, and I think that this will push people in the case more, in fact, to not the historical aspect of the Scalia opinion in the case so much where he refutes Stevens um, on those grounds, but as, if you look at Scalia's opinion, he's much more careful um, about the claims that he's making in here. Um, and I think court credibility um, is undermined when, when they go too far. They went way too far. Contrast that when they took the Voting Rights Act case. Contrast that, like, like you say, what they did in the Peekaboo case. Contrast in a lot of the cases, and I think that they just uh, simply, um, I guess they just wanted to end it. Um, but I don't think it's going to end the di this discussion at all. Last but not least, you saw it on display. I, back to the Elena Kagan hearings. You couldn't tell. I couldn't tell. And I watched every minute of it at my desk. It was within my job description, Dean. Um, <laughs> Junkie. Um, you couldn't tell when the senator was asking the question whether it was a D or an R if you went like this and you don't memorize their voices until the last word. And if the last word was Citizens United, it was a Democrat. If, and this was weird, the last word was Thurgood Marshall, that's what, that is what happened. It was a Republican. But they were making identical claims about an activist court. And Citizens United, it's just, it's, it, it suggests that Bush against Gore is no longer the court's bad hair day. It looked partisan. And the American people don't drill into the analysis in a careful way. Very few people can claim to be election law specialists. I don't. Any more than you can claim to be an immigration law specialist. But God, people have opinions. And um, on this one, they feel very strongly because of the practical point that Dave made earlier. We smell a rat. We smell the big rat. Money corrupts. Well, big money corrupts. It's nonsensical to tell us otherwise. And he didn't write an opinion that really addresses that intuition. And I think that was um, uh, one of the many failures of the majority, of, of the Kennedy opinion in the case. Let's go to the election law expert first, and then we can well, go back to the small. For, for those of you who have looked at this opinion, I, you will probably agree that the most compelling statement in all these opinions is at the beginning of Justice Stevens' decision where he says, I regret the length of what follows. <laughs> um, now, that said, um, um, th there, I agree with Tony that there, there is a disappointing quality of, of um, Um, simplistic generalizations in Justice Kennedy's opinion, but a high level of abstraction about a pay on to the open marketplace of, of expression that I fear um, the, the theory, the First, First Amendment theory has gotten beyond or has, has failed to capture the complexity of events and behavior and conduct in this area. So this very simplified notion of more speech is better know what no matter what, uh, simply doesn't reflect the reality of, of politics, how public officials operate, how the public operates. Now, I'm not saying I have the answer to these difficult questions, but there is more to it than simply invoking these aphorisms one after another. Um, and I, I 
the limitation that judges have to decide questions and, and the law is a shared enterprise and therefore we use language to communicate them as a, uh, communicate as a shared enterprise, but there are limitations in the ability of language to capture the complexity of, of events and motivations and I fear this is an area where that is particularly true um, uh, about campaign, these uh, campaign expenditures. Um, I, I personally think this language about corruption is an unfortunate word because the reality is politicians act out of fear and gratitude, and both, maybe more fear than gratitude. Uh, you don't need corruption for massive collections of money that are, especially now under this case with business corporations that can be aggregated with legal privileges that are in, were intended for purposes of commerce of collecting capital and uh, serving the economy now to be uh, sidetracked uh, for political expenditures where the direct players in the political process are working their fingers to the bone trying to raise money and large moneyed corporations now going to do these independent expenditures. So um, I am I'm not going to venture to say a whole lot more other than that I find this the analysis to be very unsatisfying and that the, the, the practical reality of how politics works and government works and how people vote and how politicians work simply is not captured by uh, Justice Kennedy's opinion. I find the reaction to Citizens United baffling. Um, and the reason I find it baffling is uh, I understand that there are people who uh, like campaign finance reform, may want to, you know, cabin political expenditures by corporations or whatever. But what the court did was do a an analysis of the First Amendment that led them to conclude that this provision of this statute was unconstitutional, and so they struck it down, which is exactly what they did in another First Amendment case involving uh, a congressional ban on crushed videos. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that case. There was no uproar about that, that the that the Supreme Court said it violates First Amendment principles and there, ergo, it has to be struck down. But because there, are, because there are so many people who are advocates of campaign finance reform, suddenly the court must have gone rogue because they struck it down. And I, I think actually if you, if you look at the decision, you may disagree with the reasoning, but it is, it is reasoned. Uh, and let's talk about what this statute actually does. Uh, you know, this isn't just campaign finance in a vacuum. This is an actual statute that, as the court explains, that it makes it a crime for the Sierra Club, a corporation, to publish a book opposing a candidate 30 days before an election based upon their lousy environmental record. That's, that, that's a crime. And the court said, we can't have statutes like this. Corporations have First Amendment rights. And Buckley held that you can't say that someone uh, is, doesn't have a First Amendment right to, to, to spend money and speak, in, have political speech based upon their wealth. And so somebody, some individual who certainly has the capacity to influence President Obama, who has a billion dollars in wealth and gives you know, en endless am amounts of money to, to run ads in his favor, is, is allowed to speak. Why not a corporation then? And corporations, by the way, don't just support Republicans. Corporations gave major amounts of money to the Democratic Party uh, during the Obama election. They, they assess their interests based on who they think is going to have power. Um, and a lot of corporations don't even like to give money because they find that it puts them in an odd uh, position with respect to consumers. So I think that probably, at least in my mind, and this idea about the court overreaching um, by deciding uh, the issue of whether to overrule the, the prior precedent, um, they actually looked at the narrower grounds and found uh, that they didn't resolve the case. It wasn't as if they just blew by them and, and didn't look at them. They analyzed them. And they concluded that the only way to, to resolve the case was to decide whether or not the prior precedents, Austin from 1990 and, and McConnell, should be overruled. And they needed to decide that in order to decide this case. So again, you can, reasonable people can disagree with the analysis, but the idea that they did something startling uh, 
I, I, I'm just kind of taken aback by it. And I think it's just because politicians, this is their, this is their bailiwick, this is what they care about, and so they decided to make a big issue about it. Once again, I need to revise and extend my remarks. <laughs> um, the, uh, I it was intentionally trying to be stimulating and provocative when I said politicians act out of fear and gratitude. But of course, one must also recognize the broader fact that public officials act out of their concern for public interest. And I don't want my statement to be taken without recognition of that. But it, it fits together because even with their, their, their views of public interest, um, they all have to have that fear in, uh, about the influence of uh, huge amounts of independent expenditures. Um, I, I'll give an example for people here in Arizona that we just had a primary election and uh, up in my county, in Maricopa County, uh, the sheriff, Sheriff Arpaio, spent three quarters of a million dollars of his own campaign money basically attacking somebody in the Republican primary for county attorney. Now that, that, that walks, talks, and quacks like independent expenditures, and I'm not going to offer any comment about whether that does or does not violate Arizona expenditure laws, I don't know. But there's no question that that, that had a significant influence on that election. So this, uh, the, that was not corporate money, that was campaign money that the sheriff had raised legitimately. And again, I make no comment on whether he did anything inappropriate, but it's an example of the effect of independent, expe and expendi independent expenditures can have. Oh, and I did have another comment about uh, Maureen's comment about whether the court overreached. There has been a lot of a, a comment to that effect, and it, it looks that way, but on the other hand, you read the opinion there are areas of law that w once they get decided by a court of last resort are extremely difficult to revisit. It's, it can be very difficult to have a case that would give them a chance. So I think one must temper uh, the view of what they did here with, the, with that perspective that this is a very important area. If you think their decision is right or if you don't, it's still an important area of First Amendment law and it could be really difficult decades could go by before uh, an appropriate test case could come. So one has to give them some leeway in that regard. I think it's really important. They were very worried about the fact pattern that I described of uh, a corporate entity publishing a book, like the Sierra Club, um, you know, publishing a book that uh, opposes a candidate based upon their uh, um, environmental record or their gun record, if it's the NRA or whatever. And when, when the United States was asked those questions at oral argument, they couldn't say that that, that, um, you know, that, that wasn't a problem. And that's why I wish you'd written the opinion instead of Justice <laughs> Kennedy. Um, because I think I, if, you, if you read the opinion, um, what, everything that, that Maureen is saying is true. And, um, and it is that part of the opinion that Professor Sherry is pointing to as saying, look, hold the phone, people who went hysterical without reading the opinion. But it happens all the time, and it yes. just doesn't happen in cases like this, and it, it happens with respect to the establishment class. Woo, the sky's falling in a term where they upheld one display and struck down another. Um, or other websites where they, they point to results selectively in order to uh, uh, mobilize a base into thinking that the court should be taken out and killed. Um, my point is, is, is that, I mean, I can tell you right now, they, the, the Justice Stevens raised the point about whether foreign national spending now is, is potentially unconstitutional, restrictions on foreign national spending in American elections are potentially unconstitutional. I think there is a surprisingly strong argument, post-Citizens United, that it is. And it's, it has a lot to do with how Kennedy wrote the opinion. It would be much harder uh, to make that claim by looking at the concurring opinion by Justice Scalia. And so I think there was literally a kind of recklessness. Um, to, uh, you know, he got carried away um, with his enthusiasm. And um, I think I wouldn't point to U.S. versus Stevens, the crushed video case, but the performance of the chief and Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, in which they were much more uh, careful in, uh, in justifying a restriction on speech by an American citizen that supported or was done in coordination with a foreign terrorist organization in which I think they showed some 
mature recognition of the tension. That in, and in this case, there are First Amendment values on both sides. And, and I think he just d did a very unsatisfying job of explaining to those of us who think that corruption matters um, why uh, that should, be, should not be given more weight. That example and that answer and oral arguments, it, it was all over but the shouting once that answer came out. So, so I think you know, exactly right about the law and the problems with the law, but then you might do an overbreath. There's other ways in which I think they could have achieved the same result and educated the American people instead of simply enraging them um, with an opinion to the extent it was read or understood as sounding pretty cartoonish almost about something as sophisticated as the First Amendment. And we have implications right now with the mosque um, and on other problems the day after. Breyer's taking a lot of hit, uh, hit this morning in the news because he said um, uh, that he thought that the First Amendment may not protect the burning of, a, uh, of, of the Koran. Um, now, it's taken out of context. Did he um, actually say that, or was that just an no, implication? No, it was taken out of context. Um, but it's because people don't have much patience for a more subtle conversation about the limits of the First Amendment and the ways in which uh, it's a balance between uh, the things that we want to hear and the cost of, of hearing it. Professor Marcus. I, I didn't go hysterical until I read the opinion, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just mildly irritated. You were born hysterical. Yeah. <laughs> you, you hired me, so. Um, uh, I, you know, on one level, I am uh, very sympathetic to, to, the, the, to um, Ms. Mahoney's question, why were people so up in arms about this? I, I don't know what the exact number is, but it's like $1.2 billion was spent on the last presidential election. You know, I'm, at what point is, is the tsunami of money so, so significant that you know, Exxon spending some more will really make a difference? I don't know. I mean, it's an empirical question. California allows these kind of expenditures, and it tends to be the case that few company, few corporations actually make independent expenditures. They find um, uh, lobbying a much more effective way to uh, influence, um, uh, influence uh, voting patterns. Uh, I, I, what, 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 but, but that's why I started by saying it's, it's after the opinion that I, I went hysterical because, not, not to uh, add to what others have said already, but yeah, of course the court addressed the avoidance issue and said, you know, we can't but decide the facial constitutionality of, of the McCain-Feingold Act. And of course the court went through the, the requisite stare decisis analysis to explain why, uh, why it, it could uh, uh, legitimately uh, jettison McDonnell, uh, McConnell and Austin. It's just the, the, the paucity of reasoning and each of those is, is so poor. I, I don't want to um, gild the lily, but just to read a little bit of Justice Kennedy's uh, analysis of stare decisis, he says, Austin is undermined by experience since its announcement. Why? Our nation's speech dynamic is changing, and informative voices should not have to circumvent onerous restrictions to exercise their First Amendment rights. Speakers have become adept at presenting citizens with sound bites, talking points, and scripted messages that dominate the 24 hours news cycle. I could go on, but it's that vapid discussion that I find deeply unconvincing and, and disappointing when it comes to something as significant as getting rid of a case decided only uh, eight years earlier. Uh, it's without a doubt, I mean, you can, it's obvious because I think O'Connor wrote Austin, right? So uh, O'Connor wrote Austin, O'Connor's replaced by Alito. Um, it, it's clear where this case comes from. O'Connor has, since, since, um, since stepping down from the court, made uh, integrity in judicial elections one of her uh, signal uh, 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 causes. Uh, so, so the atmospherics of this case are so overwhelmingly ideological that it, it just sits very poorly, I think. And for that reason, I don't, I don't find, uh, on, on a different level, uh, the reaction uh, particularly baffling. Um, Ms. Mahoney, you made the point earlier that um, it was not the court, the majority of the court, that was sort of in line with public opinion, but Justice Kennedy. Um, I, I'm not maybe misquoting you, no, but no, no, just no. sort I, of the, that he's in some in some areas of the law he views emerging public consensus as relevant to his constitutional analysis. Right. Yeah. Do you think that that is? Do you think that that is at play here with with his decision? And do you think, based on your experience, both arguing before the court and as a law clerk, um, the fact that he wrote the majority opinion, what, what do you think is sort of at play here? Yeah. I think probably um, 
public consensus is less relevant to him in the First Amendment area than it is in uh, definitions of due process, uh, Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, you know, those, those sorts of areas. Mm -hmm. And I, I haven't tracked it carefully enough to be sure, but I certainly in the Citizens United area, if he thought public opinion was uh, highly relevant to the uh, contours of the First Amendment doctrine, he might not have been able to come out as he did because I think that people have probably correctly represented that there is a substantial public opinion in favor of uh, regulation of corporate expenditures. Mm -hmm. So why do you think it was his opinion to write? Um, well, I think he often writes the First Amendment uh, opinions because uh, he, you know, his, uh, it's an area of the law I think that he cares, you know, very deeply about and uh, usually, you know, he's going to be the swing and so I think uh, he's given the opportunity to write some of those decisions. But clearly he's going to come down with the majority, yeah, it I, seems, regardless of who wrote the opinion. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's right. Uh, although the fact that um, Roberts, you know, wrote with Alito on stare decisis separately uh, might be telling for some future cases as well because I think that they uh, didn't really embrace the Casey kind of analysis in the same way that uh, Justice Kennedy, I mean they don't, uh, they join Justice Kennedy's opinion but I think they kind of uh, make a real point of saying that they think that um, when you have to reinvent the rationale for a prior precedent, it's really no longer de deserving of respect and that that was what was going on here. Anyone else? Final word? Yeah. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left to take questions from the audience about any of the cases. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I, if I, I'm not sure I understood the question properly, but the, the statute that was struck down actually allowed media corporations uh, to spend all the money they wanted um, in, in supporting or opposing candidates, which is one of the things that Justice Ken Kennedy's opinion says, give me a break. Why is it that media companies get to uh, exercise their free speech rights, but other companies don't, showing you know, the fallacy of the logic of the legislation, basically. So, and certainly as an individual, Rupert Murdoch can spend as much money as he wants under Buckley. Because he's an anchor baby. <laughs> <laughs> More, I'm sorry, I'm, it's late. It's because he became a US citizen. And he did so in order to um, uh, avoid certain restrictions on foreign ownership of uh, media corporations um, that too I think now it's a good question um, whether some of those laws are, are, are overbroad statements given First Amendment interests but more on that another Supreme Court review because I think it's coming. Yeah. Yes? Um, you know I don't know if I 
Any comment? Thank you. Yes. Two parts to your question. One is how do you define a media entity? And I think there, I think Kennedy does have the better of the argument for the reasons Michael's pointing out. There is no, con that while we have a right to press, there's no constitutional significance to uh, an organized media right to speak and a pamphlet here. And so once they carved out that exception for media corporations, they produce a problem of analysis. Second question you're raising is a tougher one. Who is a foreign national? And, um, and, and what do we do with multinational corporations and how do we define uh, individuals? It's not just, um, if you are a permanent resident, uh, non-citizen, you are exempted from the federal statutory definition of um, uh, a foreign national who cannot engage in certain uh, election campaign expenditures. In other words, the law is actually pretty darn generous um, with respect to foreign nationals if they have a presence here. And what some of the corporations, uh, their hook is that they have subsidiaries, American subsidiaries, and that domesticates them for purposes of the statute, makes them American citizens. Then the only restriction on them is not about whether they're foreign, it's whether they're a corporation. In this case, uh, Citizens United deals with whether the ways in which corporations and unions are treated differently with respect to independent expenditures was constitutionally sustainable. Um, so uh, if they're entirely foreign and they don't have an American subsidiary, um, in that case then they would be subject to substantial restrictions on what they can do uh, because they're foreign. Does that make sense? That's why I wasn't being entirely facetious when I said um, a much bigger issue in terms of effect on American daily life, it strikes me, is the ease with which a foreign corporation can become a citizen for, for, the, for purposes of having su a, a substantial potential effect on American elections. That strikes me as more important than, um, not to get into another controversial topic, but individuals coming over the border and, and, and having children and, and those children becoming American citizens because of the citizenship clause of the 14th Amendment. The difference is one's done it legally, uh, the argument would be, and the other isn't, but not true. The child by constitutional perforce legally becomes a U.S. citizen because of being born here. Nonprofit and receive, well, Dave was doing the facts, uh, but it was nonprofit. I think the, the concern was it was receiving small number of donations from corporations, right? It's the There's a good point that he's making that applies, um, and, and Justice Kennedy deals with it somewhat toward the end of the opinion. One might, I'm not going to, the theory of the corporation problem and her saying, look, a lot of corporations aren't going to do this anyway. Some corporations aren't going to do it because they're prohibited from doing it. And he's, what he gets to that point in the opinion, he says, let's leave that to corporate governance rules. Um, let's leave that to, you know, the definition of what are permissible aims. It's like those of you who are members of the state bar uh, know that the Board of Governors can only do certain things uh, with your dues because um, it is deemed to be outside of their jurisdiction to use your dues money to promote certain political causes. Nothing about this opinion, maybe I haven't thought it through, undermines the claim that government may have a legitimate interest in restricting the political activity of uh, federal workers, of um, uh, corporations in some contexts or under shareholder 
rights, um, you know, we need to, we need, I'm looking at Elliot because we need a, you know, a corporate specialist to talk about what those existing regulations look like. Does that make sense? Back? You might be right as a matter of not-for-profit status. We have somebody back here. Mm -hmm. Not that I know of, but you're going, yeah. um, I think that he answered honestly. You know, he's an officer of the court. He was asked the question, and he gave an answer to the best of his ability of what he thought the statute meant, and it's the, the strongest argument in favor of what Maureen's arguing. Was there another way they could have handled the case? And one way they might have handled the case is to say that the law wasn't actually meant to apply to particular pay per or direct TV videos of this sort. I mean, there were some narrow possibilities um, that I think weren't frivolous that they could have said to distinguish this particular um, uh, uh, entity wanting to engage in electioneering. Um, but the bigger point that you're raising, I agree with her, I don't know a way uh, to make that distinction. Okay. Um, Elliot. I remember when Buckley versus Vallejo was decided, and I remember having that similar thought. The reality is it ha does have an expressive quality, but it's more than that, and that's part of what I was thinking when I said earlier about the, the, the events and the behavior here is more complex than this linguistic equivalence of speech with expenditures uh, allows. Just think of the difference between my ability to go to uh, Congresswoman Gifford's office every single day and tell her what I think and tell her what I think, and tell her what I think. Nothing restricts it. But I can't give her or uh, another candidate above a certain amount. I mean, it's, it blinks reality and other areas of law not to see expending money as different. And I think the difference is she has to listen, and I may give her ideas that she can use herself, but if I give her money, I'm giving her something fungible that enables her to express herself um, in a more powerful way. And, and if I give her a lot of it, um, I think that she's probably going to listen to me a little more closely than if I just go to her office every day. And, um, you know, the, it, it just seems so obvious. But this me. isn't about giving money directly to the I candidate. Know. It's not about political contributions. It's about a corporate entity that decides that they want to run an ad about why uh, Obamacare is really a bad thing. You're a, let's imagine you're a, you're a health care company. And you, in fact, know that it's going to destroy your business. Um, and there are candidates running, some who are in favor of repealing it and others who aren't. And you want to run an ad explaining why um, you know, the voters should support a particular candidate because of their views about health care. 
And that seems to me to be core political speech under anyone's definition. Now, you might decide that the First Amendment's got enough play in the joints that, that they're going to you know, allow corporations to be treated differently. But it certainly is core and pure political speech that we're talking about. Right. But it, uh, no one disagrees that it's core political speech. But there's, there, and, and the court is embracing a particular theory about what we do about that. But it's stockpiling assumptions, um, uh, money and speech, corporations as persons, corruption is only direct quid pro quo, and, and after a certain point you have to stop and say, you know, we lost track of things. It, I, I know we have to close, but the, for a long time, Owen Fiss, among others, have said, you know, this notion of a marketplace of ideas, we embrace it, we talk about it, but we've, we've always thought that the best uh, response to bad ideas is counter speech. And if that's the premise, if that's the experiment, if that is the empirical assumption on which this is based, then you have to pay attention to the capacity for counter speech. You know, that's what I mean, there are First Amendment values on both sides. And so Fiss said, and this, this was true when we were first developing television, you have zero sum scenarios and broadcast media and concentrations of power, vehicles for expression, uh, p good people in good faith, card-carrying First Amendment enthusiasts thought maybe to maximize First Amendment values, we might have to do something ironic. We might have to limit it in order to assure that all the ideas get out there and we have some capacity to reason through them. And that has been rejected at almost every turn, except maybe with capture problems like broadcast media. But it still, I think, responds to some of the reality that, that disturb people um, in co some contexts where they feel they watch TV and there are like ideas there, but none of theirs. It's like the Russian visitor years ago who said, you know, the thing about American newspapers that's interesting, you all talk about your freedom of speech, uh, but I read your newspapers, how come they all say the same thing? And you kind of go, oh, you know, that was when I was young and and uh, civic ideal dewy-eyed myself. Um, and if that happens, if you don't think that's a First Amendment catastrophe, whether it's happened, I think we catastrophize without really analyzing, is that really what's happened? Are we really so stupid that when we watch these ads, we don't suspect that there's, you know, certain pockets that are paying for it? Um, and, well, and But that's why, you know, the disclosure laws are important. Yeah. And, and that's what the, what, what the next argument, I think, is, is are the disclosure laws constitutional? And that, the other case we didn't discuss, the Doe case, and I think uh, we've got some opponents of disclosure laws on the court. And just one more doctrinal point, and that is that people have to remember that, that, that you can make all sorts of good policy arguments, you know, one side or the other or whatever, but this is supposed to be strict scrutiny. Yeah. That, that, that's the other the problem that a lot of the campaign finance reform av advocates have, which is that Strict scrutiny means you don't get to just say, well, there's some reasonable reason why this statute ought to you know, uh, work. I it's got to be more than that. Republican Party versus White Scalia, if you want to know how strict scrutiny ought to be done, look at how Justice Scalia looks at strict scrutiny for the announced clause of judges running for office. I think it's a fabulous example of doing it uh, with, with all the teeth in place. But that same strict scrutiny should have applied in Holder uh, versus humanitarian law project, and I don't think even within a given term they're necessarily bearing their teeth as strenuously uh, in every single case. Um, and, and if they did, then okay, great. But I don't think as a practical matter they always do. Okay. okay. Now we can all go outside and bear <laughs> our teeth. There's a reception in the lobby. Thank you very much.